Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Hometown Cable, our program. As every Sunday, it's called What's Going On Here. It's Calvin Castine with the camera. I'm Bob Venn, and this morning I'm between two older gentlemen, and we're going to talk about some old days. Our, our topic this week is on prohibition and, uh, uh, let's say, some running of booze across the border and things like that. And this is one of what we expect to be several programs about prohibition, and we'd like to invite you, and if you have any stories and you... Know anything about uh, things that were happening in and around the Champlain area uh, back in the 20s to uh, contact us? Champlain, Ellenburg, anywhere. Okay, Ellenburg. Ellenburg, was that bad too? Okay, Ellenburg, uh, anywhere along the area that you know. I know Champlain apparently was the hotbed, and they because of the Route 9 going straight down into the rest of the area, the Meridian being here. Anyway, on my left is uh, Ed Favreau uh, from Champlain, and on my right is Arville Trombley. And then we'll uh, we'll ask each of these gentlemen just give us a little synopsis of who they are and and, and uh, where they came from. Ed, uh, born in Champlain. Uh, Tell I us a little bit about I, your family. I was born in Moores, and I lived in Champlain for near all my life. And I've uh, brought up five children, and uh, I worked at Harris Plant for 44 years. But before that, I was in. Uh, on the bootlegging side to try and make a living. <laughs> Ed, uh, who were your parents? My parents were Tell Us Four. Tell Us Four? Favreau. Uh -huh. You have brothers and sisters in the area? Yeah, I had George and I had Armin and I had two sisters, Laura Colomb and Edna Angel. Okay, now, now Favreau can be spelled different ways. It is spelled yeah, different ways. You're, F you're F A V R E A U. Right, right. Is that the real way? That's the real That's way. That's the real way. That's the old way. The old-fashioned. Uh huh. Right. And Some you, turned it. They F A V R O, but uh, right. and very yeah. few it goes by yeah. that. Uh, now uh, you say five children. Tell us your the children's names. Richard, and and uh, Jim, and I got a son that's Father Bruce Favreau. Father Bruce Favreau from uh, from uh, Saranac in the right Lake Clear, and I got Jeffrey, youngest one, lives in Rose Point. Okay, and you got and Sue. Don't forget and Sue. Sue. Oh, don't Sue. forget Sue. My daughter is so <laughs> Works for Transborder. There you go. Yeah, the Transborder. Yeah, yeah. She works. Okay, Transborder. Trans God, they've been changing a lot yeah. of the oh, brokers. Yeah. Been working at Transborder since last April. They've they've changed around. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, uh, then we're on my right here. Of course, this time he's had a chance to think of his children's names, so he can re make sure he get them all this time. Orville, where were you born? You from the area? Champlain. Yeah. And your mom and dad? My father's Leon Trombley. My mother was a Fifield. She was from Shays East. Lived to be what, in her 90s? Huh? She was on her 100th year. 100th year? Yeah, she hadn't had her 100th birthday yet, but she was on her 100th year. 100th year. Yeah. And you lived just south of the city here on Route 9? Route in 9. In the village? Right. Yeah. When uh, I married, I had, we had six children, three boys and three girls. Who'd you marry? Got to, well, you got to find out who you Who'd you marry? Tell us who you married. Well, I married Noella Trudeau. One of those uh, Trudeau families down, down on <laughs> Kings Bay. Kings Bay, right. Yeah. Awfully close to Calvin Castine, aren't you, too? Well, he's a, one of my nephews. Yeah, close nephew. I don't admit it. You know, <laughs> a real close nephew. His <laughs> wife. His uh, wife and my wife. No, no, wife. his mother and your wife. Sisters. Are twins. Twins, right. Twin yeah. sisters, yeah. Born on Christmas Day, too. They were born on Christmas? You knew that. Huh? Well, I guess I have heard it, but I guess I kind of forgot it. Yeah, they were, that's why Carol for Christmas Carol and Noella for Noel. You know, oh, uh, there you go. So tell us uh, what uh, Mr. Trombley's been doing over the years, except driving cars and whatever. But what, uh, I was, you were in the jukebox business? I, I never drove cars. You never, okay. No, tell, us about, for that. tell us about, tell us about, you were in the jukebox business and what else along the years? I well, ran a bar for three years. Midway? Midway Restaurant Bar. Then I, uh, I've been in the paving business for 32 years. What's that called? What's that called? Northern Black Topping. Northern right? Black Topping. You started that. My oldest son started that. I uh -huh. got that. All right. Tell us about your, your family now. Well, what do you want to know about my family? Um, who are they? Tell us who uh, your are. What a boy. Yeah, what and boys. girls. Larry, Perry, and Joe. Yeah. Cindy, Lisa, and Marsha. <laughs> <laughs> you got them all now. All right. Can't go wrong that. Uh, Joey, of course, is the owner now of uh, Cavanaugh Realty. Cavanaugh Realty. Right. Larry owns the paving business. Yeah. 
And Joey is superintendent for his brother. Okay. And your the ladies, uh, Lisa is married to uh, Dale Cardan, Dale Cardin, lives here in right, town. Right. And uh, Cindy? Cindy married George Bombardier. He's uh, over here at Harris. Okay, I forgot one. Just tell us quick. Marsha. Marsha. Oh, Marsha. Marsha lived in Buffalo many years. She was there 17 years. And uh, she's single now. Okay. Well, you know, we've been talking about talking about prohibition because certainly it's a, it's a big thing in the area. Uh, 50, 60 years ago, it was a matter of fact. It was uh, in the 1920s. It was the number one employment in in the uh, northern part of the county. Uh, it, was, it was more people employed in that than anything else. If you want to call employed, they were making a living of doing that. And some time ago, uh, if, if you've listening to your radio, and that was W. C I never can remember the name of the station, but it was a lot, huh? CFE. CFE uh, contacted, and I don't know, you weren't on the program, but Ed, you were. Tell us about what happened on that radio program you were on. Well, they came on, they, uh, we uh, taped it out, and they had tape on it, and there's still tapes going around. Some of us got tapes of, of all our kinds uh, of where we bootlegged and how we bootlegged and what we drew, and uh, we weren't there. Uh, like the old fellow said, we weren't robbing anybody. We're just making it for a living. <laughs> I think your 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 expression on the radio, making an honest living, is what Make, you said. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> you call that an honest living? Well, yeah. <laughs> it all depends who you are, I guess. <laughs> During that program, that was you yourself and Frankie Manette. Frank, uh, Frankie Manette. And, and then uh, Gerald Blaine, I think, uh, talked too, didn't he? Uh, on a little bit. Probably did. He was I on the program. Really and, but uh, where our program was, uh, what we were, where we were drawing it from, and how we were drawing it, and we were drawing it in all open cars, and we would load at the border here, and we go as far as Plattsburg. Few, sometimes you go a little bit on the other side of Plattsburg, but where the old air base is, that's where was our our stopping point and a transaction for New York drivers to. So, different cars. We had old Cadillacs and Studebakers and uh, Lincolns and everything. All touring cars loaded right there and right over the back seat. The back seat was full. We put 35 to 40 cases of liquor and wine and beer in there and whatever. Then you weren't trying to hide it in the car anyway. Oh, so no. <laughs> there you was no hide, hiding it. Huh? There was no hiding of 40 cases <laughs> in the air. And they had a, a I was in cases of little bags with ears on, probably you remember here and there. On the top, you mean? Like you remember there, Marvel? What's that? Remember, with the, the bags of beer, a case of beer with oh, little burlap, ears. Had the had little ears, like ears. Oh, yeah, well, everything really was in burlap bags. Those burlap days. bags. Yeah. Everything yeah. all in burlap yeah. bags. And, and the driver uh, sat on a, uh, yeah. on a yeah. case of beer. He yeah. did. And oh, he put oh, a little oh, pillow yeah, on top. Oh, yeah, that time we sat on dry, a case of beer, just by right plastic. All right. Ed uh, and, and Orville, too. Now, let's start from the beginning. Well, I'll tell you what you want. I think my father got started. Your father was in the business. Oh yeah. Well, let me just ask you a couple of questions before you get into that. There were many people who were driving, and they didn't own the cars. Is that right? In that's most cases, right. the drivers that's didn't right. own the cars. That's right. Okay. That's were there many Canadians that brought beer through and, no, and, and were dealers I themselves? I don't know. No. So uh, no, we would load at the border. Right. Either at the Meridian, or Tourist right. Garden. Or the Parisian, where the old, where now the custom is, that was the Parisian, okay. and that were the three main loading places. Right. So the people that owned the, the bought the liquor, and owned the cars, were people that didn't usually do any driving. They were in the background more than anything else. Well, they, paro they patrolled the roads. They patrolled the roads, make sure you can get through. Right. All right. Yeah, yeah, we had pilots. Right. Yeah. Now, the, it, were there mostly drivers from Champlain, or were there owners of businesses no, no, here too? No, no. no. Drivers. All drivers. Okay. All drivers. You never had a driver from down downstate. Right, but down. what about the owners of the business? Were they all out of town people that did that owned the lick the oh, liquor yeah. and the beer when it came through? We used to load mm -hmm. trucks. I remember up in Plattsburgh. Of course, I was young. And uh, but I go my father a lot. He took me for company, you know. And we used to, uh, Ed Kelly. You must remember Ed Kelly. Yeah, Ed Kelly. I do. Yeah, Ed Kelly used to have this those big trucks going down in New York. And we load those trucks up. You must remember that. Ed. Yeah. Yeah. And when they got to New York, these trucks would be back in the yard. I'm talking about great big trucks. And an alley would be unloaded, and there was two carloads of cops protecting them so that they wouldn't be robbed by the, uh, the gangsters. Well, let me give you just a little bit of background before we talk about the area we're talking about. 
in the in the teens, early teens of uh, 1900s, 1914, 15, 16, numerous states found out that they thought that uh, uh, booze was bad for the people, and they individually started to outlaw drinking within the states. And by 19 uh, 18, 19, 17, 18, they, there were only 16 states that still allowed drinking in the United States. This was, there was no amendment yet. One of those that still allowed it was New York State. There were 16 that did not allow drinking. In 1919, I, I had a date here, in 1919 they, they passed the uh, 18th Amendment which made uh, drinking in the United States against the law and that continued on until 1933 so we're talking a period from about 1918 because some of the states had a rate restriction straight through till 1933 and during that uh, 14 year period there was the biggest operations in this area was bootlegging that's the period we're talking about right. now you were born in what year Ed can I ask you 1911 1911 and 16 1916 so you can see when he got over, he was 17, so he was saying, in 1911, he was 22. So he probably got in the latter part, in the late 20s, and you were loading and uh, doing uh, riding with other people or whatever? No, well, we had a loading station over home. A loading station, all right. Yeah, yeah. Well, t t someone started, I will tell you, you were going to tell us about your father, excuse well, me now. The way my father got started, of course, this is going back to what he used to talk about. Okay. Before, you know what I mean, when I was too young then. Uh, I forgot who used to run a hotel here years ago, the Champlain Hotel. That's before the Ventures had it. Terry, yeah. No, no, before the Ventures had it. Terry, oh, yeah, way, no. way, way, way back. Way, way back? Yeah, when I was a, maybe a baby, I don't know. You mean the Champlain Hotel? Yeah. It was the, uh, that there was, uh, that used to be the old Moore place. Moore right? place, yes. Moore. Okay. Right. And, and uh, he told my father, says, Leon, there's money to be made in going to Canada and hauling wool. Yeah. So my father started off with a team of horses. He'd go down to Canada, get a load of wool, and in the winter time, was a sleigh. And he figured if he'd take, pick out the coldest nights, because he could come all through the fields. And they, well, all he got, all the bootleggers used those trails they had then. And uh, he made quite a bit of money doing that. And of course, he had the farm there, and we only had, I forget, 10, 12 cows, I guess. And from then on, then he started going into into the booze business. And he was wasn't a big big bootlegger, but he had about three four cars on the road. And uh, I know I probably want me to go with this. I can. Well, first of all, th these were not bad people, uh, you know. And we're going to refrain from mentioning too many names that are not with us. He wants to mention his family because it's pretty well known. There were a lot of people in this area. It was hard to prove on some of them. And, well, I'll tell you, uh, going back to this uh, hauling over the border over this uh, uh, sleigh, when he started drawing liquor, he had what they call a buttolo. They are little square sleighs. Eddie must remember those. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you go to Canada, to Naperville, with that little mare, Mag. I drove her many, many times on a, as a little boy, you know. And he was a horseback rider over the, on the farm. And she was a great mare. My father goes to Naperville, bring her up as far as our place, which is 14 miles. My father said she'd trot all the way. And then the next night, he'd take off for Plattsburgh to, to bring his load in. And that was just liquor those days. They couldn't put too many lo cases. I don't know how many cases he put on a load. But when he got down to, when he got down to, uh, oh, I'll, I'll tell you how he was dressed. He wore big, the winter underwear, big heavy pants, coonskin coat, buffalo robe that he could, if he wanted to lay down his sleigh, he could. And um, buckskin mitts and all that stuff that they, well, so he'd be warm. He'd drive way down to just this side of Plattsburgh, about maybe a mile, where the old theater was there. The old, old drive-in. Oh, yes, okay, up oh, in the North, North Country shopping area. Yes, yes. Well, my uncle had a little farm over there. My father pulled in there and he'd park his horse in his barn and he'd use my uncle's horse to finish his trip into the city. Then he'd sell his load, come back, pick up his horse, and I uh, wanted to let Mary rest a little bit and give her some grain, stuff to eat with water. And he put the money in the lining of his cap. My mother fixed his cap up so he could hide his money. Because you never know when somebody's going to hold you up or something. And you... Uh, hey, Frankie. Hey, these are the, the ninjas. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, 
She really picked right. Well, take a short break right here. Uh, we just had another man come in, and we'll uh, get our seating arranged and give Calvin a little rest on his shoulder. We'll be right back with you, Orville. Okay. All right, we'll just continue a second, Orville. And you were saying now when they uh, they bring the load and he would get rid of his load in Plattsburgh. And they paid him. Who, did he sell to someone to take it out of the area? Did oh, he sell I, it to speakeasies in Plattsburgh? No, I don't know where it was. Don't know where. Okay. But he put the money inside of his cap, he lay down in his sleigh, and he go to sleep. And the horses go by themselves? And he wake up, and the little mare would hit her nose on the gate oh. over home. The <laughs> <laughs> yes. horses were pretty good, didn't yeah. they? He never sold that horse. horse. He said, I'll never sell that horse. You made me a lot of money. All right. All right. Well, the man who just came in here is my uncle, Frank Manette, right here, my mother-in-law's brother. Frank uh, is born here in Champlain. And uh, uh, your father and mother, Frank, were who? I know, but those people out there don't know. Tell, <laughs> them, tell them who your father and mother were. Israel Manette. Israel. And Israel Lucy. Manette. Well, with a Larry. Let me say Larry. Yeah. His father was first cousin to my father. Oh, yeah. guys, no wonder they were, you were all doing the same <laughs> things back then, huh? Yeah. Now, Frank is well known. His father was uh, contracting. My grandfather was a contractor in the area, and Frank worked with him most of the time, right, Frank? Well, Over the years? Not all the time, but some. Lot. A lot. And was a, you, then you got working for the government a little bit, too. I got substitute mail carrier for years. <laughs> 30 years plus? Oh, yeah, just about. Maybe more than 30 years. <laughs> yeah. Now he's taking it easy. He sold his property on the corner down there uh, next to the bridge on Main Street and now living in Rouse's Point. The, the government heard he was a good driver. That's why they <laughs> <laughs> yeah, He was delivering mail instead of uh, bottles. Eh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Ed's going to have to, is leaving us <clears throat> a little early. He's got other commitments. And so we'll be talking with Ed Moore in the next few minutes than we will with the other, but we'll get back to them on and off, and then eventually have Orville and uh, Uncle Frank here. So, Ed, uh, I forgot to ask you, your wife, uh, maiden name was what? Filia. Filia. She was from Champlain? Yeah. Also in the area. The Filia family was uh, great in the line of bootleggers. Oh, <laughs> yeah, they were, huh? <laughs> they were big bootleggers. Is yeah. that how you, well, the, the Filia, yeah, there we go. Uh, I drove for mostly everyone. <laughs> I can't name it was a lot of <coughs> there was a lot of them. How did you get involved first, Ed? About how old were you when you started? You remember? I was I was around twenty years old. And right? you were driving. Right. You, be, you had your license. I Didn't care anyway. No one was going to stop you. You wouldn't let them. I don't remember if I had one or not. I must have. I drove a car all the time. Well, you didn't. Uh, <laughs> you didn't that. need no license. Uh, now you were driving them uh, liquor uh, yeah. cars and all that. They had, the only thing they did was take the field when it got changed. Yeah. <laughs> when we drove, when we drove for a load from Meridian or Tourist Garden or Parisian, when we drove to Plattsburgh, I uh, I can't tell you how we uh, get there, but I uh, I know we never seen the road. It was always in the dark. Never had no lights on. We always drove no lights. Frankie can tell you. We didn't know. You could see a light for miles away. Even even somebody where we were all worn. Not to light a cigarette and, you know, be stopped somewhere and light a cigarette. You could see a cigarette for a long ways away at night, yeah. you know, with a match. And yeah. Well, so. you didn't tell us now whether you met your wife who was a filial because you were driving cars or whether you started driving for the filials because you, went your, you met your wife first. How did it no, come about? I, I met my wife after. After, all right. After. I drive for, for the filials. You remember your first night or your first, your first load? Yes, I remember the first load. Were you scared? I was, I, I was, and I was not. And I drove in, and I come into uh, uh, Plattsburgh with a big Lincoln, and uh, Pee Wee Gold was supposed to drive it, and he didn't want to drive it, so I drove it. I drove it, and I come in about 7.30, and there was a open top, and everybody in, at the BFD, everybody was waving their hands at me. And I was waving, just right, and I went to and I got into the city of Blasburg. This was in the summer, I take it. Then. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Did you do it year round? Um, it's summer and winter not, they were driving? Oh, yeah. Summer yeah, in the winter time you had to be careful what you were driving because you could hear those. Uh, you take even wine, it was cold enough, it would freeze and they'd pop. You'd hear them bottle pop, pop, and you hear them, the cork could fly off, you know. But uh, All right. Now, Ed, for instance, are you. Where, would, where did you pick up the car? They, did someone would bring it to your well, house? We had some hidden places in Champlain here. We hid and hid. Right. Then you'd go to the car and you'd go north? Uh, we, we'd go, we'd go, pick up the car and we'd go low. But did you take the highway to go north? Oh, yeah. Did, was there, there were custom stations. Oh, yeah. There were no customs in them days. There weren't no customs? There was no, no. only one custom here. 
I do only cost a new one. So they didn't even know when you were crossing the border, really. Oh, oh right. you had to watch yourself. You could get caught in Canada just as well as you were getting caught here. But you didn't report in when you went up oh, north. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no, no. You don't cut them on the border. You didn't report in and you didn't report out. <laughs> and you came out with no lights and you come out that. Yeah. Well, once you come down a couple of times at, through the fields, you made a road. Didn't they see those roads? No, no, they didn't have a road. We, we didn't have no road. Oh, you were on the cars, right. We had the cars. We come in, it was all dirt roads. It was all dirt road all the way to It was all dirt road. It was all dirt road. This is dirt road, yeah. We used to leave the boat and the cloud of dust behind us. You couldn't even see for about 10 minutes after. <laughs> That's right. The old flat rock up there. We used to go by that flat rock. Eh? Remember we oh, yeah. call that flat rock? I used to get, uh, go to the Parisian. We load, that's where we load up. Excuse me, I don't want to, maybe you remember this. The time my father had a car in your barn and the officers come there. Yeah. You tell that story. I don't, I don't know the whole story on that. Yeah, one. well, the, what do you mean when they were parked? They were parked and there were two cars that loaded in the barn, Dick, and they were those sliding garage doors, sliding on, on wheels there. And the law comes in, boom, yeah, when I see them come in, there they come. They have to go. You open the car. The door, and he just looked in, and he, and he turned around and went right back, and the other one stayed in the car, and away they went. I said, they're going to come back after it. Sure and hell, they never came back after it. At night, we took the car out and took the load of uh, <laughs> booze and went out at night. Of course, we'd, uh, we'd draw mostly at night all the time. We're not, uh, never at daytime, unless uh, a few times daytime. In the morning, a lot of time there, early morning. I used to early go morning. 4 o'clock in the afternoon, they were never radio. Yeah, I remember. 4 o'clock. Yeah. They'd wait on the corner. They'd wave at me on the corner down there. Who would? The people? <laughs> the people. Did, did, did yeah. you think they knew oh, what yeah. you were doing? Oh, they knew what I, was doing. <laughs> I remember. I remember. Oh, this, yeah. I remember this time when Frankie was coming. Like <laughs> my car was skipping like hell, and I was going towards Ingram. I said, Frankie, she's dying, dying. Oh, he says, he says, get in there, get in there. That's all the ones I hear, bang, bang. There's Frankie got me in the ass end too, and, and, and he puts it, and he gives it to me, and we shove me right. We stop at the gas station. What was it? The gas station. No, Reeds. Reeds was it? Reeds or something. Reeds. Reed gas station pulled in there and they repaired. I wasn't playing daylight. That was probably around six, seven o'clock in the morning. So this, you each had a car that that trip. That what you're saying? Well, he, uh, he was Frankie, behind you. No, with Frankie was up. Three, four cars. I three, four went out at 14 in a GMC truck, man. Mm -hmm. 14 cars yeah. in a own GMC oh, truck yeah, at one yeah. time. Yeah. I remember when Conrad LaBelle's cars used to go by at night. Yeah. My father would be home. He said, just like a funeral. He said, I go to LaBelle. <laughs> they, they, they we had all kind of schemes, just like yesterday. Yeah. Well, I remember, I remember loading, uh, go, load at the border. That was uh, what they call that border, Goldie Clark border there. Yeah. I remember loading across the border. That's their parish then, bill. And then come out of there and drive into the cornfield. And finished loading, I had one of those canopy trucks and load on, and load, load with corn, load down on the car, work like that. And I come out of the cornfield, and the law is waiting there. So you're drawing corn for the early. I said, yeah, you got to start, you got to get it in. <laughs> now I went, I went right there, and never stopped me. No. Well, there must have been a lot of money changing hands between the, the owners of this booze oh, and those uh, officers, oh, so to speak, oh, huh? Oh, I mean, no. when they opened your door and saw those two cars, they know you weren't uh, painting the cars. They knew, they knew huh? Somebody. Nobody just thought it was home cars. I'm out of yeah. the family because it was yeah. a farm. We had, uh, we had, uh, what do you call, watchers, eh? We had watchers on the car. Well, well, about the pilot. Pilot. Huh? They call pro. We had pilot pro. <laughs> They go down the road and the pilot car go down the road, see what's going on, and then, then all around the place, they know where. Then he give us a signal, either well, with a light or something. They remember the signal okay or right. there was no remember there was no radios during that time, no, no, and the police no. didn't have radios either, no, no. so they couldn't uh, radio ahead. And I don't know how many telephones you they didn't had. Have too many police been around in the first place. No, the, the troopers came around there late. Uh, you know, the two, the late two late most dangerous men was Johnny Craig and Charlie Caswell. Charlie Caswell, right? <laughs> then were the two dangerous men. They were after our rear all the time. They were. And we'd hide them out, and we'd lay on the floor in the, in the Champlain house there and watch for them. <laughs> they, they'd come through, and we'd lay, <laughs> leave no hotel, no light, and then when they go oh, around yeah. circle and they go back, we'd send somebody up there. To That's see. spotted. You know they were out or in. Oh yeah, yeah. out or in. When we knew they were going to bed, we would take off. You sometimes know? you sometimes you get the plasma in one day. Sometimes take you two days and three days. Oh yeah. Well, where did you sleep in the car? 
Yeah. Behind the barn, anywhere. Behind the barn. Stay in the barn. The barn. Stay but in the but, barn but you had you places old. you could stop behind people's barns. Well, and they that. got paid well, by me somebody. From Plattsburgh, I didn't do much of that. Yes. From Plattsburgh into uh, Waterford or Glen Fall there. You went down that far? I went to Albany. You did, Jack. Well, yeah, sir. Took a spring next to the racetrack. Not regularly, though. Well, that's the way we unload. Yeah, we used to do that. See, we, we never, my father never did. So never went that never far? Never went that far. But uh, Paul P. Eddie Green, all them, they used to go to New York then. Some car you go to New York. Well, Uncle Frank, when you were driving, uh, you got paid by the load, by the week? The, the load. The load. By the trip. Yeah. What would they pay you, say? Uh, you, you get 25 bucks from the board of the well, Plattsburgh. 25 bucks. And, and the Plattsburgh. 75 bucks to go to Saratoga. Yeah. Now, to give people a perspective, what was the average person making who was working in a week? Well, about 14 cents an hour up to <laughs> yeah. 14 yeah. cents an hour times 40 yeah. is little about 7 or $8. Well, and they got $25 to drive the well, load. Yeah. So you can see why that they were well, in a, in a, very hour. anxious to well, drive. Well, drive like money <clears throat> I worked at Harris and I first started at Harris there. Was sure I, was, I was taking home Six days a week, I was taking home fourteen dollars and twenty-eight cents. Oh, yeah. yeah. Fourteen dollars and twenty-eight cents. <clears throat> so I assume that all this money you made driving, you put all that money away, yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. you <laughs> saved all that money. Is that right, Ed? No, no you didn't save I, it. I, I didn't get that. Yeah, I I got that. <laughs> we go by the Meridian and uh, go by the Tory Garden, eh? Right? Montreal, Montreal. Uh, <laughs> easy come, easy go. Huh? Easy, easy come, come, easy go. Easy, huh? easy come, easy go. Bob, yeah. when, when Monkey Bennett used to go through the border, they'd see me through town, then the girl be waiting on the corner, go back to Meridian, <laughs> like a <laughs> Monkey is your name. That's a New York nickname. Well, I wasn't nicknamed all the way through. Monkey. Yeah, yeah, Monkey. Here oh, comes Monkey. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I used to drive for Paul C. Young. Yeah, <laughs> Paul. you got to remember that at that time, the road we're talking about is right up Oak Street here. That yeah. was the yeah. highway, yeah, right? Yeah, that's highway. Well, that didn't Oak they Street. put up road barriers? Did they knew you were coming or anything? They didn't have enough yeah. officers at that time. They were moved like it was going down around 29. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Got done around what? Late 31? 30, 30, 33? Yeah, when the record. Probably was still doing the 32. Yeah, around 32 early but 32. The, uh, but the dolly no law around, but after a while yeah. the law kept coming in, kept coming in all the time. We knew, late, everything we knew was their car, in. we knew their car all the time. We had we had old old car. We didn't we didn't even have a license plate on them. Oh no, uh, no plate. No, we no. never had no plate on them. <laughs> it wouldn't be exactly. yeah, that's just another law you were breaking. After all, if you were bringing down thirty cases remember, of boots, remember, you don't care about license plate. Like I say, like I say, one in the dark. Uh, night when I remember hitting a gal in the rear and the god then <laughs> shit flew all over. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute there. Are we going to break this gal in here? Whoa, whoa. <laughs> oh, I forgot that. <laughs> and, uh, and had bent all the, all the front end of the car, couldn't turn right. So I finally, I finally zigzagged out to the corner where I was turning in, in Plattsburgh, and I finally made it there. I couldn't turn the car right, though. I would bent all the rods. <coughs> now, that, the car was pretty well loaded, but you got 30 cases yeah, of that. Somebody big car was 60. Bag of beer, that was all bagged then. It was all bagged. Yeah. Big, yeah. All bagged. Quart yeah. bottle. Yeah. Now, you had big cars. Because if someone were going to stop, you could outrun them. Is that the well, idea? Well, well we had faster cars. They did at that first yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. But on the last, they used to get our good cars once in a while, and they'd yeah. keep them, and then use them. Yeah. yeah. Now, did you work for more than one owner? Well, yes. Well, you drove for more than one group? Oh, sure. I worked for Eddie Green and Paul Filio and Old Leander and Alec Trombley, and uh, don't talk about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I can yeah. remember, George, you, know, you were coming over to my house. I was a kid, and you'd practice running up and jump on the gate. Do you remember that? Oh, you'd practice see what would happen if you get stopped. No, no, huh? if you got chased, you'd you got to go. The fence, yeah. fence wouldn't bother me. I wouldn't touch the fence. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's your... I used to call me the deer. I used to call him, and the fence didn't bother me. So if you were stopped, or going to be stopped, the only, one you, the only thing you cared for was yourself. You, yeah, you, oh yeah, you didn't, you didn't... You didn't worry about the car. You weren't losing anything. Yeah. You were losing the load yeah. for the other guy. Yeah. And then you just take it run. You That's a good car. Oh, yeah, they're all notified. Yeah. They're on, you caught. hear, you yeah. hear bang, bang, up in the air. They, sometimes they'd shoot for you yeah. a little bit. In fact, they shot, when they shot at the, at the rock here, you know, uh, on the road to Brazen. They shot, they shot me right through here. They what? They shot you? Yeah. It just, it just burnt enough. It just bled a little bit on the, <laughs> on the edge. And it, 
Johnny Craig. Yeah, Johnny Craig. Yeah, we did. Johnny Craig. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> okay, we'll take a short yeah. break and get right back to you. Thanks for watching Hometown Cable. This is only one I say. I'm going to be, we hope, two or three. If anybody out there wants to come and go to confession with us here uh, on TV, we'll be very glad to talk about it or just talk about prohibition in general. Maybe you were one of the people, one of the ladies out there who, who, uh, these people spent their money on after when they when they made all that money uh, driving those cars, right, Orville? And by the way, I want just one thing. The youngest one is right here of these three. He's number two, and the old man of the group, the real old man, is right there. What year, <laughs> Uncle Frank? 19? Well, you were born? 19? 1909. 1909. Two years older than uh, Eddie, and... Uh, of course, he was in it maybe a year or so before anyone because he had the age. And uh, oh, we want to come back. We're going to ask these people if their mothers knew what they were doing while they were driving these cars. We'll be right back. Uh, John and Craig got me over there. Okay, just a second here. We're back on TV, and oh, we yeah. got stories coming in from all angles. And please remember, this is not rehearsed. We have not prepared anything. So if it's not in that actual uh, order in any way or we go from year to year, don't worry about that. We're telling you a series of stories. Uh, of, of, of true stories that happened back then. And we've got to remember that these are not bad people. Their parents were not bad people. It was a thing to do back then. It was a way to get easy money. It's like stealing an apple off a tree from there. They didn't think they were doing anything wrong, right? Ed said on radio that he's just a way to make an honest living, right? Which was... Uh, <laughs> That's right. That's right. I wasn't stealing anybody. No. It's the fun we got out of it. We weren't stealing anybody. No, no, no. The fun we got out of it, Bob. And yeah. fun we got out of it. We were, up, we were up all night. We were up all night and try and fight our way through to getting the load through for the people. Yeah. And... Uh, all right, before we go further, what about your parents? Did they know what you were doing? Oh, yeah. Oh, they knew it? Oh, they knew it. They didn't, they didn't like it, but they, Must they had no way of paying me money to work on the farm. Yeah. They had no, no money made on the farm them days. Were you living at home at the time? Yeah. yeah. I was living at home at the time. Yeah. But, uh, and uh, in the first place, next place uh, at home, we'd drive there. That was our headquarters up there and back the barn. And, bring in two or three loads and sometimes they stay there a day or at two. your farm at the barn yeah, yeah. in the barn what, and that's why when you drive on saturday night were you in church on sunday morning oh yeah oh. <laughs> yes you went to church on saturday morning oh yeah uh, on sunday morning all right but you made a short <coughs> trip like platford you would <laughs> well if you were in platford you must have made a church in platford right uncle right, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah you don't know the platford came right back and what where did you do with the car while you were waiting to go out that night keep it at your house at yeah, your home we always had to pick it up because you did, if you parked it in your yard, that's a dead giveaway. Oh, right, right there on my corner hit. there, above the fountain at that big barn there. Yeah. I used to park in there. Yeah, park in there for a I couple of days. Just leave the car empty, not loaded. Hay hey barns. Oh, hay barns into a... Um, oh, yeah. um, where do we, we, I, oh, I never left the cars out, outside or right around yeah. the daytime with them or nothing like that. Did Brand you make a... Stetter, Brand Stetter's garage in Plattsburgh, that's what they used to do in them days. Park cars there in that big garage where they had on yeah. Margaret Street at one time. Did you have a did you have repair garages in town where you could get work oh, these cars you know, worked well, on? Well, it depends where the work. Uh, small job, but big job like uh, skip the the time and all that. Plattsburg would take care of that. The boys yeah. would that. The owner of the car would bring it to Plattsburg. We had uh, uh, Midway. It was a <coughs> place. We had quite a few cars right there. I remember. I remember pulling in there one morning, and uh, the law was right tight on me. I pulled in there, and. By the time they went around one side, I went around the other side, and a fellow by the name of Dumas was was uh, just reading ready to milk his cows. So I said, uh, that's why I ran into the milk house, and I jumped right in the, with the milk cans and the goddamn cold water way up to here, and he shut the cover down. <laughs> I, could hear him talk at, I could hear him talk at the door. I <coughs> the door. And said, he must have left right through the field. Uh, right uh, the but they had your load in the well, car. they got my load. They didn't get me. Yeah, well, that was cost of doing business for the owners, right? Yeah, yeah. So, how long were you in the cold water? Well, I don't know, but a hell of a long time. <laughs> Until the officer got away from the place. <laughs> well, look at this. It was cold. Oh, oh this, uh, this is off the record. Now. Huh? Well, we better, we got to be careful. We don't want to mention too much on uh, some of these. Uh, we, well, I, I can play with it. I was going to country school then, and, and uh, this fellow <coughs> driving for my father. No, he wouldn't drive for my father. Two cars come along, and right there in the daytime. And the law come along, they chase him, and then they both took the field right near the uh, around the schoolhouse and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And one of them ran underneath the uh, in the woodshed, covered himself up with uh, 
Well, what it was, stuff that they do in their, uh, I mean, starting their fire, what do you call them? Kindling? Kindling wood, yeah. yeah. But he, he got caught. The other one ran around, we had an outside toilet, and he got underneath the outside toilet. <laughs> <laughs> and he stayed there. He stayed there. Yes, but was, they didn't get him. That was a week ago. That only happened near and near. Yeah, was, farm. Was, oh, yeah, they were his farm. Pee we go. Pee we go. Yeah. You yeah. have a model in. Uh, after they left, uh, Catherine was a teacher then. Yeah. <laughs> She goes to the job, she don't know he's there. She sits on the seat and she <laughs> <laughs> So the teacher, she went out, she, he was hollering, cats, cats. <laughs> she don't know where he's coming from. Because he was calling cats, remember that? Yeah, cats. Yeah. Well, and tell me, uh, during this period, uh, the late 20s, how many drivers locally were oh, involved? Oh, oh, Twenty-five, thirty? Ten? But they told me on a flatbed. No, it's some, know. some other <coughs> Creed and all that. Like but you there, didn't but have any uh, any know. strange drivers. Well, you had to have somebody that knew all yes, the roads. Right. And otherwise, you you knew the hiding place and you knew the getaway place where. Uh, yeah. How many loads a week would you uh, drive? Oh, Christ, every night. You every day. How many high street trips in one night? Your That's father was, his he car. was, he, no, no. no, his car. How many cars did he have, Leah? Uh, I'm going to call it, one, one car, two cars. Two, two, two cars. Yeah, but two he cars. had three at one time, he was only running two of them. Yeah, he'd only go as far as Plattsburgh. Yeah, no, no. Uh, get rid of his there, right? Yeah. Well, when you work for the big boy like Eddie Green and do oh, different and all that, we go to a lot further up. <laughs> yeah. You have no older brothers? No. 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 You're, you're the oldest, so that none of his family was driving. He probably wouldn't let them drive anyway, would he? Probably, you know, you'd rather hire somebody going to get caught. I took the field one night, though. Got lost in the woods. <laughs> uh, with riding with somebody? With my father. We were going to, um, we had a load coming up, and we we're going to, up on the, uh, the town line road. It was a dirt road back yeah. in those days. So my father would always take the lead, and he said, give me about 15, 20 minutes so I can head you, head you off. And he used to take me a lot of times for, to go with him, you know, to pass the time away. I was maybe about 12. 12 years old, and it rained the night before, and uh, a fellow by the name of George Perrier, you remember George Perrier? Yeah. Driving? He was driving, I think it was a Haynes car, and we got down to the corner where uh, Hayes' Woods is, and yeah, the Hayes school on the yeah. corner, they got a roadblock there, the officer has. So we stopped, and the guy comes over, strange officer to my father, he asked him his name, Liam Trombley, he said, where are you from? My father said, where's she? <laughs> He said, where are you going? He said, I'm going home. He said, this your son? He says, yeah. So he said, go ahead. So my father goes down the road. He takes a turn and he goes up towards West Shazy and he says, Arvo, take the field and head that car off. Well, so he was nothing in his car at the time? No, no. Well, it's all piloting. Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, it's all, all right. <coughs> so I take the field and I cut cross lines. <coughs> and I hear this car coming. So I got out in the middle of the, of the road. I flagged him down. The guy stopped. It was George. I jumped on a running board. I said, George. Turn around, go some farmer parking back at our building. Well, he got all excited, he backs in the ditch, and he, don't we get stuck? <laughs> right to the X. Well, you were maybe about 1,200 feet or so from that corner. So they could hear that car roaring back and forth. So, hey, they, we see the headlights come on, they start coming our way. George says, take the field. We take. And it was darker than hell. And George was only trying to keep up with them. And they'd shoot in the air, you hear the, you could hear the bullets every time they shoot, we'd get 50 feet, you know. That's how fast we were running. And I remember I had a barbed wire fence and I went through it and I scratched all my chest. And I can't, can't find George. So I didn't know where in the hell I was, I was in the woods. So I creeped up next to a, a rail fence. And I laid there till morning. I couldn't sleep a damn bed. The next morning I went to a farmhouse, I called home, my father come pick me up. Of course, they got the load. They must have been wondering about you all night. They got the load, right? Yeah. And they many, lost the car. There weren't too many telephone near around them. They no, no, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> remember that? I was, remember that time I was driving for your father? We left three uh, cars, and uh, <clears throat> they caught the first one. I was in the middle, and they caught the last was one. Was that at the Lido Club? Huh? At the Lido? When George was in it? No, no, that's me. That's, uh, this one was uh, for Kid Keen. What? And. Uh, they didn't know your father and the kid Jean didn't ever knew how the hell I got there. I got there, my car had no tool baker. Well, what happened? And they caught the first one and they were, we were far away enough 
that the law in West Shays, he turned around between me and that load and he chased that load. And I see him chasing the load, I fell back and I went in back of the milk station. I hid there. By the time I hear him roar coming by again, and they headed back and they got the other load about half a mile down the road, down, down there. So I took out like that and I went down and I got the flat bridge running on, running on about seven cylinders out of Wendy Wound. They had the only eight. She was a skip and a skip and I just made it. Were you, driving, were you driving my father? Yeah. yeah. I drive him for you. <coughs> now that cost of doing business got expensive when you lose the car and you lost the uh, the, load, the, the load. load. Oh yeah. And that's a lot of money. Oh, yeah. Well, I forgot what they used. To, I know my father used said he made six dollars on the case. Made six dollars each load. Each case, case, case he brought oh, down. Yeah. If he bought down sixty cases, they give him three hundred sixty dollars. Yeah. Oh yeah. But he always said if he could make three trips, that would pay for the load. If he lost one, it'd be about yeah, even. Yeah. It was a percentage, right? You knew you were going to lose oh, yeah. some. Oh yeah, I knew it. And oh, were there many people, many drivers caught? Oh, few. Not, few. not that many. Few. Huh? What would they? What would be the penalty for driving if they caught you? Oh, I got yeah, caught. Many, a year and a day. A year and a day. I got caught, man. You got caught. Yeah. Of course, I got caught. How many days did you serve? None. You didn't serve. You got caught. Well, oh. tell us what happened. I mean, you say you got caught. T tell, tell us about how you got caught, Uncle Frank. What do you mean? Got well, caught? like you were coming. Where were you? I left the border here. We're going to uh, Albany at that time. Started the spring and all that there. <laughs> Got to Port Henry. Other words, we stayed almost uh, half a night there waiting outside of Port Henry. Till the pilot car went around, let us know the road was clear. Then he'd come back? No, no. And tell if you? The road was clear. We were parked behind the barn, uh, yes. just outside of Port Henry. Right. So when the pilot came, everything's clear. Everything oh, okay. And at the time, they were building the road outside of Port Henry, the state road. They had bulldozer, they had truck, they had everything in there. But we took off from where we were. We got to Port Henry, which you call it, Twait from uh, Port Henry, came in back from Syracuse with some prisoner. We went to trial in Syracuse and just happened to get in town that hour in the morning. So at the time we went through, so they took after us. Then we had to jump our car. Me and Bloody Creed, and we jumped our car on a pile of rocks outside of Port Henry. And then, you, then you ran? No, they got me. Oh, they we got, got you? Ron, they got too. I stayed in jail overnight, got out Monday morning. That's pretty easy. The jail below the port in it before you go up to the beginning of port in yeah. it, the jail down below. <coughs> <coughs> now, if you, were, if, if you were caught like that, did the owner of the car uh, give you bail or try to help you out in that, or was yeah, that your yeah, responsibility? I was a then at that time. Yeah. Yeah. I had to wait to go Mrs. Burdett and bail us out on Monday morning. Yeah, yeah. Then we had to go to the trial of Syracuse, and when uh, Davern in Plattsburgh, yeah. Laura Davern there, yeah, 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 yeah. cost me 350 bucks. But you and you got out of it. Would you do tell you weren't driving? Oh yeah. My father was caught twice. Oh yeah, I got caught once. Uh, driving? No. Reading got caught. Yeah, one time he went with a hired man, and he had a brand new Oakland at the time, and he went down to Meridian in the afternoon to get some beer. It rained the day before. They couldn't couldn't cut the hay. I was just a kid then, and he went down there and. So on the way back, I think I'll be a couple of cases of liquor. So he put it in the cushions in the back seat. Comes through, and when he, he had to report over here. Yeah. I thought they had the customs. Yeah. yeah. So when he got here to the customs, reported, <coughs> and the officer came out, looked at his car, and where you been? He said, went over and had a couple of drinks over in Canada. Well, he said, I think we'll send you to Rouse's Point to be checked out good. Because he knew my father was a bootlegger. <laughs> Well, but my father wasn't bootlegging like that, just about out of it. And he goes to Rouse's Point, and Good Road down there was the head one of the customs. He was a cousin of my my, my mother. So my father goes inside, you know, he tells Good Road, he says, uh, I didn't have nothing. He says, Scrap, he says, no, what do you want to send me down here for? About two minutes later, the other officers come in and said, we found two cases in the car. <laughs> we... <So anyway. coughs> they, they put my father in jail, my they won't accept the bail from him. Had to be by somebody else, and my grandfather went down bailed him out. That's how long ago it was. And uh, <laughs> Grandpa went down bailed my father out, and he had to go to. Uh, he went to Auburn, New York, for his trial, and he had a choice of paying, I think it was a thousand dollar fine, or serve thirty days in jail. So he paid his fine. You, and then they raided the house one time. And uh, raided your house? Yeah, his my, house. Yeah. yeah, I was in school at the time, going to country school. And uh, they, uh, 
we come home that night, my mother's all excited, my father's in jail. <laughs> they came in there, and a bunch of state police just to keep everything quiet, but the Border Patrol's commander of the customs. They started searching the house, but it, at that time he quit having his stuff around the house, but he had a five-gallon can of high wine, they call it. Yeah, that and that. And the pantry. So my, my mother, we had a big barrel. My mother takes the cover off the barrel and she puts the can in there and she started pouring some in, the, in with the flour. And she puts the flour in with the, uh, inside the can. And they finally found it. But they couldn't get no clear test on it. So you went to trial on that and uh, you beat them. Because they couldn't get a clear test. We're talking prohibition and right this morning we're in the, uh, facilities where tonight's the Columbus building on the corner of Oak Street and Elm and Champlain and when they talk about the customs house of course Oak Street went up to the border the first house as you head toward the Sheridan here on Elm Street it was a brick place that was the customs house back in the 20s uh, it's where uh, Franklin lived there now does he still live there no I think he sold that all right it, Franklin right across from the funeral home is where the customs house was right and there was nothing between here and the border so when you came down you got a good running start you had to stop here for the bridge you know to, but that was a bad corner to make down here a lot of them hit the post and brought the post <laughs> yeah we're going to take a short break and be right back and we're going to be we're talking about bootlegging sounds bad it's a lot of fun according to these guys we'll be right back <laughs> It wasn't for me to have to cut the mare too in the front. Uh -huh. Oh, uh -huh. no, 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 no. Well, we don't have to encourage these people to talk, I'll tell you. we got all three of them ready to go on, it, and on, every, on every expression here. Again, we're going to get back to Ed because uh, Ed's uh, got to be leaving. And Ed, tell us about some of your uh, uh, herring experiences. Let's take, for well, instance, the yeah. time you got shot. How, tell well, us what uh, happened that day. After, after that, they had a rough load to take to, uh, to uh, Plattsburgh and uh, they need two drivers so Paul you know I don't know if you know what my name is no we better not mention them because oh, their, their family might not like it we got to leave we got to leave tonight and they meet me about 7 30 at the border so we loaded we loaded up there and Morris was the other driver with me and we <coughs> headed in the, before we got the pilot told us right off the bat he said, you stay to the main highway and don't get off or don't jump that car or you see this. Come find out <coughs> where I said, uh, Mars, I says, I don't know what you do. I'm not scared of the law goddamn bit, but them birds are two in each car, two in front. He said, you hold, stay right bumper to bumper with us right to Plattsburgh and said, in fact, uh, I never never seen the guy before. And never come find out was a Al Capone. Uh, is, that, is that right? Yep. Two Val Capone, four Val Capone men, two in front, two back. We had then beer with liquor we had there. Uh -huh. And we got out of the flat bridge, and uh, they, I tell you, I was still shaking. They got out of the car, and they gave us the money, and there was no question. They got in, they jumped the car, they had two drivers, two each car, and, they, and the way they went from Plattsburgh down to New York. Uh -huh. But I tell you, I wasn't scared of the law God damn, of uh, them a bit. Uh, the law, I mean, I was scared of them more yeah. than I was scared of the law. Was there some kind of a broker who uh, <coughs> you'd get a job? Who would assign you? Did you pay somebody to no. get get, get a, a load for no. you to drive? No? no, they knew you who you were and they would come and see they you? They knew who you were, yeah. but you had to go. When we went up to the border here, we had the board. That load had to be paid before you, before you left the border. But so you didn't pay for it. Oh, yeah. Oh, they gave you oh, the I money? Seen, uh, they, uh, Huh? Uh, they gave you the money. Oh, yeah, I've seen big rolls of money I had in my pocket. <laughs> to, to, to pay for it. Oh, to pay for it. Know. Paid for the paper line. They, they, they had to pay for the load. But that was every time. Not no, every time. That, but that wasn't usual. You didn't do that, Uncle Frank, in your case, huh? All of them done the car go up there and load it and but, get out with it. You but just leave. You wouldn't say it. It's See, what they were in, aiming for is not to be the pilot, be shown thrown up around, hanging around up there because they knew something was going. Yeah. So was there always know. a pilot ahead that... Uh, oh, yeah. Well, well we're talking about, a, you say a pilot, of course, people... Uh, uh, what it is is the car, observance yeah. car ahead of time to, to uh, see me, if the coast is clear. We knew where we were going, we knew where we were well, going. They, they, they were working for uh, the boss at the car. Uh-huh. Yeah. All right, now, the night you got shot, tell us about half of that. Where, well, where, where was, were you driving? I was loading in back of Parisian. You were that, in, that's in Canada. And they had the roadblock and they had two cars, two cars and no nose. So I, I was coming to the light, all I wanted to see a flashlight. 
Uh, well, where was this down here? Uh, down by the flat rock. They were just go yep. by the road. With the yeah. up here. So oh, what, up there. What the okay. hell to do? What the hell to do? I I didn't. I, put, I like down. I just shoved her, and stepped on her and opened up right out. And I hook. Um, I guess I got him balled up a little bit in the ditch or something like that. But I uh, smashed mine a little bit. But I got through. They took off after me. But by the time they took off after me, before they got the car fixed, I think I was hidden. I was hidden back down here in back. Uh, Old, uh, remember where the old Lexington shop, old Trombley, like that? Oh, yeah, yeah. I hid my oh, on Cedar I Street, yeah. I see hear them go through. And I had to stay there till then. Next night, about 7.30 at night, I took off at the load. But when did you get shot, though? I was shot there. Oh, that's that's where you, was oh you in, in the and car? The you were in the car in when the you got car. shot? Never, yeah. Oh. <laughs> never, never, never stopped. Of course, it was... It wasn't right through it. It was just a burn up yeah. the flesh on the on the edge, yeah. you know, to well, make it, to feel a little bit yeah. blood running. They were pretty uh, easy with their shooting. They shot a lot, didn't they? Oh, there was a guy killing Cooper. Well, I saw that. Yeah, there was no reason Mars. for this, really, to be and shooting like that. Was Gordon there? and Moore there. Remember when the Dixon shot Gordon and Moore? Yes, I oh, remember Dixon that. Shot. I remember reading it. Yeah. yeah. No, Dixon yeah. shot the guy in Cooperville. Yeah. Cooperville. Uh, All right, now. They shot in Cooperville. <coughs> yeah, Cooperville. Okay. Oh, remember old it. Charlie, old Charlie boy, what are you doing for you? <coughs> yeah, but Charlie never killed <coughs> somebody. Used to get the tires on you or try to get the gas tank. Yeah. yeah the, uh, I've heard this story. Orville has mentioned this to me before when we were talking. And I might add, anybody out there, when you see either one of these gentlemen, they can tell you a lot more face-to-face uh, -face -face than they can on TV, obviously, and mention more names because they, we don't want, we're not trying to incriminate anybody here. But Orville mentioned one time that this happened in Cooperville. There was someone coming down Route yeah. 9B. No. Uh, yeah, 9B. 9B. They used to have a single bridge at that time in Cooperville. Mm. Yeah. Right in the afternoon. And we're in, we're in uh, Cooper, my father and I, and my father's cousin, Jack Trombley, from, uh, from Massachusetts. And why we're in Cooper, I don't know. But we got a gas station getting some gas there, and somebody come in and says, a guy just got shot over on the, uh, along the river. Uh, they were river chasing road. him. Huh? They were chasing him. Yep. Yeah. No, no, they didn't chase him. They flagged him down. And he went through. And this officer roused his point. He's dead now. Jumped on a running board and shot him right through here. And they dro he drove as far as where Tato's lived. They were cutting hay with a sigh. That's down toward the mouth of the river we're That's talking right. about, yes. And uh, he gets out, he was staggering, he says, I've been shot. So they told him to call a doctor, and he went and lay down on a boat. There was a boat parked there, and he'd take water and shove it in a hole like that, and he'd stick his fingers and he'd try and stop the blood. But when we got there, oh my God, there must have been 100 people there. But he, he was already dead when we got there. They covered him up with a white sheet and they yeah. waited for the corner. And the corner was Oliver La Fountain from Champlain, all Oliver La Fountain. Oh, Oliver, yeah. And we waited there, and they finally came, and they had a basket you know, to put, put a body in. And I was there when they laid him in a basket, and he had these britches on with, with high cut shoes. And he had all army colored, colored coats to clothes on. And just swear to God, that man had picked up, laid in the barrel of blood, then put there. I never forgot. Well, it was only maybe 10, 11 years no. old. He wasn't a local driver, was he? Out of New York. He was out of New York. Uh, his name was, uh, I just <coughs> mentioned it. He probably loaded up near the yeah. 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 point border. Yeah. Yeah. And don't make it any less serious because but, he was from New York, but it wasn't somebody that we knew. No, no, no. But uh, he was only 18 years old, too. Well, must have made you think a little bit next time you got in the car, huh? To, to think of right? You know, you know, was from Ross's point, though. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, he never... He never got anything out of it either, <coughs> and he was wrong yeah. doing that. You don't shoot a man, kill a man for a road of booze. Well, you know, you were talking yesterday, uh, that uh, man that had the knife in front of the White House, and they shot him, and that seemed like awfully drastic measures to have to shoot that man. He did. Yeah. Uh, he was not advancing yeah. on him at the time. <coughs> you have to wonder sometimes, of course, it is their job. Uh, and uh, any other, ex how long would you say, you, how long did you drive? Uh, a year, two years, three years? Two, three years. Two, three years? Two, three years? Us, uh, us. We, we were driving, but we weren't mean people at all. We never had a revolver on us. I no, don't no, think no. I ever wear a jackknife on us. No, no, we didn't that have revenge. No, if we, we were caught well. short, I'd say like the guy, if we had caught with our pants down, now we'd take the field. That's, what, that's the way we done so when people tell me you were a mean guy, it isn't true. No, You're no. not a mean guy at all, no. huh? <laughs> I remember, I remember loading. I remember, 
I remember loading down down here on 276 first house, the second house across the border, and coming to it at a 314 Cadillac. That was for US New York. And, that. and I come through the border, I stayed there all night, and I come through the border in the morning about 7 o'clock. Now, once I meet the the, I meet the car, the law, I mean, they twitch that man, what the hell to do, so I was going, not, not think a road. And I got at the corner, at the corner blink of light here, and, uh, so I made the corner there, and I could see him come, so I said, what the hell am I going to do now? <laughs> so I kept him going, so I turned Gulf Force Road, and I hit the pole, and I not broke a pole there, but I kept it going right on. I got way down to Fred Racine's, and they were getting hot on my tail, I could see him come, yeah. So I drove in, I jumped again, I brought the key with me. They were madder than the hell together. And I started, they had three, four fences there, and I wouldn't touch them fences. At all. I, 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 I got way to Trudeau there. I got way to Trudeau, no man coming through right out. I said, they're after me, they come around. Jumped in the house. And I, I jumped in the house, and I jumped right in bed with one of the guys. <laughs> I, I think it was lying, I think it was lying. I jumped right in bed with him. Right in bed with boots on. They, they came out, the old man said, they never seen him around. I got away. Now you're talking about some pretty close relatives of these people at this table. Lion Trudeau yeah. uh, family. That's of course he married Lion's yeah. sister and Calvin's uh, uncle was Lion Trudeau. Right. We'll talk a little bit more about Lion Trudeau later. They lived in that stone house down at Kings Bay. No. Uh, yeah. Uh, well Ed, you've had some, uh, you've jumped into some strange places. Uh, in bed with other people, in, a, in with the milk cans and the <laughs> In the ice oh, water. You had, you, had to, you had to take your chance. So I tell you, when you go, when you were seniors, you would want to get caught. Yeah. You had to take a chance. Well, tell me, if you had to do it over again, what would you have changed? What do I have changed? Yeah. What would you have changed? Would you save some of that money that you made so easy? Oh. Well, that, it wasn't easy, but it was. It wasn't easy money, was, huh? it wasn't it easy money to make. No, I shouldn't say easy. No, it wasn't easy, but <laughs> it was but, it, but there was a lot of it. Well, I can't get that. You're making twenty-five, thirty dollars, thirty dollars for a trip. Remember that trip. Sometimes you could make it in an hour, and sometimes you could make it in two days. Yeah. It all depends where you were. If they were on the watch, yeah. and they knew what was hurting us and killing us more than us, it was reporters. The who, were the, who were the reporters? Oh, we can name a lot. You mean these, I don't mean people that give any names, but these were people who turned in people. Uh, turned in, turned in people. Sure, turned in people. You see a, a car go by, it was loaded the burn, they call in or call in by that. Or if you happen to be chased somewhere and you get in somebody's back of the barn, and a guy come out and say, you can't stay here. I mean, you're going to get me in trouble. You get the hell out of here. What the hell are you going to do? Well, yeah. Well, you can't, I, I, you, you, you can't blame them. They don't no, want to get no, involved. No, no. They, they are getting part of that money, you know. It's the same thing today. Your immigration and custom, it's all reported in. It's, it's oh, yeah. 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 It's all reported in. Yeah. It's all the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. But today, when you're talking drugs, you're talking well, more serious well, than what you were talking oh, about. Yeah, you you people yeah. were thought of this... Uh, didn't think of it. Boot like it. I we yeah, you didn't think of it as a crime. And you know, you, you kind of think, the guy said, well, you were all right. You had all you wanted to drink. Uh, that, I said, you never, touch a, oh, no, never. never yeah. touch a drink. I never touched a drink. I could be loaded there. Never yeah. seen open. I never remember once that I opened up a bottle of beer and oh, yeah. a drink. Was there, was there any, and again, I don't want you to tell me where maybe, but were there any places in the village of Champlain that you could get a drink in the 20s? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. oh yeah, they're all laughing oh, yeah. here. Oh, yeah. You can't see all this. A lot of places. A lot of places. Yeah. Wow, a lot of moonshine going around there. When you say moonshine, but it was real beer from Canada. No, no, they make their own. Make their own. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I tell you, if you wanted they to get, their own? if you wanted to get through beer. and uh, not worry and have a tough driver. Our toughest driver around here was <laughs> old Billy Hicks. Eh? Oh, Pete Colombo. Oh, oh, Pete Colombo. Pete Colombo. Uh, right. right. We're talking names now. Pete Colombo, of course, that was in the paper. Pete Colombo was shot, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Pete was shot. Uh, he John. was shot going north, I think. Yeah, thank you. After the Prohibition, and we're going to get into this maybe with other people sometime. After. after Prohibition ended in 33, it became a good market in Canada because it was cheaper here for liquor than it was there so people started to reverse the process and were bringing liquor and beer to Canada there was no no liquor it was alcohol P oh, alcohol, alcohol, alcohol right? okay. uh, no, they were bringing it north alcohol. because they could make more money in no, Canada he got shot but he had a load of alcohol yeah uh, I remember uh, oh Pete when no, no 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 when he got shot no 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 he, he got shot over near uh, St. John yeah 
Yeah, he was. I thought he was reading it a little alcohol in. No. I was reading in that particular article. I was reading an article in the North Country when he, after he got shot, it was in a hospital up in St. John. Uh, there was a petition picked up in the village of Champlain, uh, signed by a lot of people saying what a nice guy Pete Colon was, and to go easy on him. And when he, uh, now I guess he did get out of it. He wasn't in jail very long up in Canada. He got out pretty easily. Came back and then went down to Florida. I remember. But uh, we'll take, we'll come right back. You were, were, you're watching Hometown Cable. Our program is called What's Going On Here. What's Going On is some pretty fast driving and a lot of running through the field. This guy running into Bob Wire. This guy jumping the wire sinking himself in ice cold water. Uncle Frank laughing over there because we haven't got to some of his stories yet. But stay tuned. We're going to be right back and we'll be talking with him. Uh, Frankie was a cool cat. He was a cool cat. He was a monkey. One of the uh, books in the area that you might want to find and it would sit the libraries and you buy your own is a, place, a book called Rum Across the Border by Alan Everest who is a professor at uh, Plattsburgh State, has written many books, including the latest one uh, on Point of Fair, and then he wrote one on plenty more here and the family and so forth. Well, and he talked to a lot of local people when he wrote this, and inside is a picture of a uh, big car, one of the cars that used to be driven. I don't remember what the name of the, what kind of car is that now. I don't remember. It may say it here. Just one minute, Calvin. I saw it here. Uh, boot like Auburn, an Auburn 120, and they drove these big cars because they would go 80, 90 miles an hour, and the biggest, the way you got caught was because they, if they didn't have a roadblock, it was to chase you, try to catch you, and shoot at you. Uh, all right, now, Ed, uh, did you have that kind of a car when you were driving? What kind of cars were you driving? We were driving all the time. Lincoln, Cadillac, Studebaker. Pierce Arrows. Yeah. Yeah, 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 Pierce Arrows. Yeah. yeah. Was there much a hange to a fight like a hange? Yeah. Was there much uh, running when you get west of here? Let's say in Ellenburg, Shadagay, and the Bootlegging from all, from all the way across. <coughs> <coughs> as far as it was, as far as Malone. Yeah. This was a hotbed right in here because this, this was this the channel was to New York City. Right. This was the main route. I yeah. remember coming down uh, caravans of us. I remember one morning we all come down seven o'clock. It was our head quarters that to meet all there and we were all taking our load. We went down with a car van, loaded, loaded uh, to Blackford, right down the main, main highway. And we never got caught, no, nobody got caught, we all right say too, because they had the pilot in front, the pilot in back, and they, nobody wanted, to, everybody wanted to get in front, you know, and I, I said, oh, so I, all right, I said, I, I get, I'll stay in back. So I stayed in back, and I got in the, in Blackford, hey, we were all going wide open. I got in the third, the third one in Flatford. I've been one car, one was skipping or the other was on the other car band. Well, the car, the car didn't hold up. Well, it's hard to believe, hard to uh, to think back that when you knew this much was coming through, why they wouldn't have had a roadblock 24 hours a day. They didn't have the people, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Did they really want to stop they didn't this even stuff coming in? Well, they didn't well, no, even have a customs job. officer, Bob. They did? They didn't? Yeah. They didn't even have customs officer enough. No, they had no, customs no. patrol at the time, right? That's all, but they didn't yeah. have enough to cover yeah. all, the, all the borders. So if they came, if you had a roadblock here, you would come through over at uh, yeah, Moore, right? right? I see him come here, Frank, you can tell you, yeah, when they come here, they catch a load, and a load stay in front here a couple well, yeah. of days, eh? Now, Lord, uh, I've, I've heard of Conrad LaBelle taking a Model T Ford, yeah. putting a case of beer in it, you must remember that. Yeah. Take it up on the back road and did, after one of his boys did it, so then stories. call the customers. Tell them there's a car in the ditch with a load of booze on, they all run for it. <laughs> he goes out of Route 9, see. Yeah. That happened many uh, Conrad yeah. LaBelle uh, wrote a book. He's yeah. passed away now. He wrote a book, and it's, it's all in French. But my mother-in-law has that book, and uh, we tried it. We like to get it translated sometimes. He's got pictures of uh, Champlain. And of course, he did a lot of uh, in Champlain. He wasn't from Champlain, was he? No, no. no he was from just across the border. He was in Champlain, though. Wow. He did come wow. down wow. here. So he that, yeah, his father had a baker shop. Yeah, his father had a baker shop. His brother was named John. John. And... Conrad, when I met him, I talked to Conrad, not, not uh, oh, probably two, three years ago. And uh, I went to one of his movies. He had a movie in St. John. Okay. Oh, yeah, Conrad made a movie. And he was uh, telling me about, uh, you remember, he said, Conrad, he says, Conrad, nobody stops Conrad. Now, who was the guy that got killed right over here? 
was shot. And then they took him to, to um, they got the guy that shot him. And he was taken to, it was a, like, it wasn't cops or anything. He was taken to Canada and they hung him over in St. John. Oh, that was, yeah. I, remember. I think that was a, that was that a was problem in Canada. Canada. Yeah, that was a, well, the how, guy was from Canada, it happened yeah, over yeah, here. Yeah. yeah. Well, let me ask you, how much opportunity was there, how often did a, a load get hijacked? By somebody right. else, oh, very seldom. Be careful. Huh? You you know, be it could careful. be just you hijacked. Need your load. Oh yeah, you couldn't your load. No, no, but if, if they, they, they wouldn't stop you, put you out of the car, and take your car and run away with it, no. because that was pretty. Uh, one, well, one. Aldoni, Aldoni was bad for that. We were on the flat rock once. I was in there, and there was a bunch coming toward me. No, once there was two woodmen that heard them coming. They come over with their act, boy. They said, "Let them come here. We'll take care of them." They were, they were coming, they wanted to race there. So I gave them a case of beer and got on and get the hell out of here. <laughs> get the hell out of here. And the two old fellows, yeah, I watched my, my load. Was it an exciting time for you, yeah. Ed? Did you, yeah. uh, huh? It was too goddamn exciting. <laughs> it was, uh, you think back, did you ever talk about it very much with somebody, what, like with, with Frankie here no, and we others? Talk, you, we know, don't talk yeah, about that stuff. Uh, there was a lot of it going on at the there was time. A lot of it going on. Talk about yeah. golf, though. Any of your, uh, well, I don't want to ask you that. I'm going to ask you about your brothers, but I better not ask My you brother, about it. George, 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 George was tough. George was a driver, too? He got too? shot twice in two. He, well, he was shot, a driver, too? He got shot in the knee right here, and he got done. Yeah, George. George, yeah. Remember when he got shot? <laughs> I remember when he went through the window, too. You remember when he went through the window? Remember when he kicked uh, what's called up there? What? Huh? Yeah. He kicked that him right funny. in the goddamn face, broke his nose. That was funny, uh, was, my father took me a lot for like, for company, you know. And he bought me a, a cap. Somebody got it on the table over there. It was plaid. And there was three or four load cars going in, into Pottsburg that night. Uh, a fellow by the name of uh, Walter Kratz was driving one. Yeah. George was driving my father's car. It was a Cadillac coupe. There was three of them, I think. So my father parted the road, told him to come along. Then we pulled over to Uncle George at a loading place in the back. Yeah. There was a gas station, but he had a bunch of places to park the roads inside the uh, garage there. My father thought it, but we pulled up. What the hell is the car doing there? There's two, the two loads were there. Nobody around, but then this officer come over. They said they got, they seized the guard darn load. But it happened that they, Kratz took, they were the first car. Kratz took the field. They were among the houses. George gets in his car and he jumps up on top of the load. And when he's on top of the load, his foot comes over, tries to yank him out, and the guy's jumped by the foot, and George took him right in the nose with his feet. Oh, oh yeah. Broke, and broke his nose. nose, took him to the hospital. Yeah. And then George breaks the glass, throws himself right through the window, because the other officer was coming over, and he didn't catch him either. Yeah, his pants are a half lay off, they're torn right off. <laughs> 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 I don't know about that, but George came over and he got in the car with me. I was parked across the road. My father was in the gas station. <laughs> and there was a few, they'd already called it city cops before city cops were coming in. So George said, what size cop do you wear? Or, I don't know. Let me try it on. Try it on. Fifth bit of perfection, he says. He goes right in there among the crowd. <laughs> America, oh, then there was a model. It was a 1929 Model A roadster. Yeah. I mean, car that he also was driving. So there was only two guys that had two cars to take down, so they left their car there and they drove the cars into well, to the border here, loaded. When they were gone, a bunch of guys got together with sledgehammers, they raised up the hood and they smashed that, what, that officer's car. Oh, oh the officer's car, yeah. Yeah, they've yeah. yeah, done that many times. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. you yeah. never fought with the officers. No. You never had a carried a gun, you said. You no, never no, fired never back. Carried a gun. It Frankie, was just. Frankie and Terry, we never had a gun. If you're going to get caught. Ne never would have as much as a club as a car. Yes. If you're going to get caught, you give up your load you and try to get load, away. You give up your load. He could buy another car, he says. Yes. Well, if the guard had just sat there, he'd have been hooked. Huh? He yeah. used his head. Yeah. The poor guy went down. Well, Charlie had to shot him here when he hit the, And then he hit the tree, glanced off the tree, and then he went and cut the post down <laughs> here. <laughs> we, Charlie, got, Charlie, we got him to the hospital. We brought him to the hospital and what the hell, we gave him a name, uh, Robert, I guess, George Roberts or something like that. <laughs> he stayed in the hospital today and they went and looked for him to the hospital and they couldn't find him because it didn't have a name. Oh. Well, Ed, we are sorry to see you go. We will get, be getting back, so you write down yourself some notes yeah. so you can remember you some of these. We'll, I'll put this here if you want. I'll put uh, that with my notes here. And Thank you very much. Ed Favreau's got to leave us, but we'll continue on here with I Frankie. I don't, and I don't mind that. 
telling you things on you. <laughs> I'll tell you why I say we don't have to go to trial because we never murdered anybody. No. Frankie, no, you we never murdered anybody. We never hurt anybody. Just, just drove a car. You just <laughs> drove a car. Yeah, but now tell me, Ed, is the statute of limitations over so that if a customs officer hear this, he's not going to come over and arrest you? No. He's not going to. Too late. Too late. They were too slow, they right? They were too slow. <laughs> we, had, we had them down there. I tell you, like, like the old fellow say, they were watching for us and we were watching for them. You know, that one more thing. You, What's you, the game? Huh? What's the game? Oh, you, yeah. You have four boys. Yeah. The boys ever ask you about this? Ever talk about this? Oh, yeah. This? They, you, like, they, they like to hear, to hear the oh, story? They, they get out there and dig him, dig him all this one. I'm here. He gets his tape I recorder out? Does he get the tape recorder out at all to tape it? <laughs> he should, you know, because this is an era that you won't see again. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it was a, a, a fun time, but also a serious time, and a lot of bullets yeah. were flying. I, I got uh, yeah, well, two, not, three, not too many years. These guys ain't going to be here. You know, we got a tape, right? Huh? You know, we got a tape. You gave one to him. Oh. Me? Yeah. I did? Who did I give one to? Dr. Southwick. Yes, I did. <laughs> I gave one to John Southwick. He hadn't heard it on the radio, and I gave him a copy. I made the copy, yeah, and yeah. I... Did I give you Uncle Frank one, too? Didn't I give you one? Yeah. yeah I think... Uh, uh, of, of when you were on the radio? Yeah, I think I Don gave no. you a copy. Donald Boyle got one. She, she has he, one, he too? You can borrow mine. You had about a month. Did you give it I think I did, yes. Yeah, so I copied it on a couple. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ed. For talking with us on hometown cable, Ed need, Favreau, yeah. we'll be talking with you again. You don't need that name or that uh, other guy with the BFE. No, remember the guy that uh, we had that uh, yeah, before the reporter. You mean the radio? Yeah. No, well, you can if we got it. We can mention his name. But I don't think he's in the area anymore right now. He okay. come to my house and started yeah. talking to a little bit. You can keep that. Uh, was an interview by Chris McCarris. And it was January 14th, 1994, where they went to the Legion and talked to you, right? Yeah. For the good old days. It was called Good Old Days, and it was taped. And they, there's copies around, and you could ask me, you could ask Frank, you could ask... It was a good radio program. It was a good, it was yeah. a good show. Yeah, that gives you something, too. Yeah. Well, you want to keep this, don't no. you? You don't? Uh, I'll, no, I'll got, get it back it, to you. I got, I got his address. On. Okay. Probably it was WCFE FM 91.9. And, and you follow take care. Thank you very much. You watch, 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 watch Frankie. Take it easy. We'll, we'll, we'll check the roads for you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. We're going to be your pilot. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> we'll be your pilot. <laughs> I think I've mentioned on TV, and I, uh, I belong to the uh, American Canadian Genealogical Society in Keysville. They issue two uh, pamphlets, a nice, nice uh, book, uh, twice a year. And the one that just came in last week had a story called The Trombley Homestead. It's uh, about a six-page article written by Jeffrey Trombley, apparently is the son of Robert Trombley, oh, the Bob. great Maybe Bob. Bob. And his grandfather and grandmother were Laura and Trefley Trombley. And there's six pages, and you haven't seen that yet. I'll let you see that. And in there, he talks about the homestead, the brick house next to the old Midway. Uh, it was built in the, I guess, early 1800s. He talks about the families who owned it. And one of the things he mentioned was a shooting by the well, name of Taylor or something was killed. Yeah. Uh, see, my take father. Take care of my aunt there. All right. Frankie, you collect the money when you get done, then we'll go on the time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> easy come, okay. easy go, Ed. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. Uh, well, about years ago, my father, it was Angelo Rock, lived there. Low Rock? Low Rock. Rock. Well, it said Low Rock, but uh, R O C Q U E. Yeah, okay. Where did he live? In that brick house? Yeah, he lived there, Angelo did. Okay. Well, him and my father became partners in the bootlegging. And he had a loading station, and my father had a loading station. So this lady, I think it was three guys come down. I'm not sure if it was two or three. There were three. There were three. And they, uh, they, were, they wanted to get a load, so Angela wants him to help the load. So he starts to come to my father's house, and um, my father wasn't home. So on the way back, which we're only about two miles from there, on the way back, he's I'll stop over to Dave Taylor. Lives on right on the corner where you go to Robert's Auto Sale. Okay, you know yeah, McRae Road. Yeah, well, you know what? Uh, it would be... Uh, that Road now. Yeah. That Road... Okay, was that where Major lived? You yeah, mean? Major Majors, lived there. yes. But at that time, it was Taylor's that lived there. And he stopped, they picked up this Dave Taylor. He was only about 16 years old to help load the car up. So they got down there, and when they asked for the money, after they were loaded, these guys pulled the gun. 
And they, they shot Angelo in the leg. They killed Taylor. Uh, they killed Taylor. But Mrs. Uh, they got one of the guys. Mrs. Ra uh, what kind of little rock there? The rock. Yeah. yeah. She went upstairs in the, in the attic and she had a rifle and she shot one of the bandits. And from then on, I can't remember if the ban she killed that bandit or not. Well, the. <coughs> To, to uh, what I just read, and I didn't read it real closely, uh, apparently uh, they pulled their guns and they searched Larocque to see if he had any money. And it said, uh, Jeffrey wrote in the article that uh, he had seven or eight hundred dollars in his pocket and they didn't find it. And he then picked up a flashlight to try to hit him because they had their gun and they shot and hit him in the knee. Oh, yeah. And then it said that a Taylor started to go back or run toward the the bathroom or the outhouse, I guess, and they shot him. And killed him. And, and he died, right, he died. Right. And the three people, and I don't have the names here, and, and I uh, wanted to talk to Jeffrey before I would talk too much about his article. Uh, there were uh, one from Saranac, the one was named Ryan, there was uh, uh, the other two names I forget, but, there was, but they were all brought to court, and I think they were they were sentenced to uh, three to nine years, I think, uh, and so forth. But your dad could have been in that oh, yeah. shooting. Well, if, uh, if uh, my father had been home, he'd have went. It wouldn't have been this Laura. Yeah, but yeah, but you see, this, uh, uh, Taylor. But you remember, your dad was older and may not have done what Taylor did. Okay. May not have run. May not. You know, they they but might have thought twice. He might have put up a fight too. Might he, he might have done that too. Yes, all that. Well, let me tell you one more thing to see if this brings back any memories. This is from the North Countryman of August 27, 1931. 1,000 cars held up as barn burns near Champlain Plattsburgh Road. Fire of unknown origin completely destroyed the large barn owned by Lee and Trombley just south of the village. You remember that? Not that. Uh, Rapid Road barn burns. Uh, on the Plattsburgh Road, uh, uh, early Sunday morning, August the 30th, oh. nearly 1,000 cars mostly northbound to the border, resort hotels were held up for an hour while firemen fought the flames. The barn was filled with straw. That was on a rapid road. And the fire was so hot that the fighters had difficulty in remaining close enough to use the hose. The blaze was discovered at 8 o'clock and the hurry call was sent to the Champlain Fire Department. Before the apparatus could arrive, the flames were devouring the straw and dried timbers. The cars were held up by lines of hoses stretched across the road and could not be moved until Guy Branch, remember that name? What year was that, 31? 1931. 31. Conceived the idea of elevating the hose on long sticks across the road, the hose over the top of the road, so the cars could go under. Oh, that's it, is, it is thought that a lighted cigarette or cigar may have been thrown into the loose straw by a passing motorist, which was very close to the highway. My father. Never no, my father, that wasn't 31, Clap. this was just a few years ago when you were at the farm. But right? you don't remember this one? No. It was was there another Lee and Trombley? No. 1931. No, no. Well, there was, well, we'll have to check on that. You have to check on that, right? Yeah, that's that, you don't remember that, huh? No, I don't remember it very well. 31. All right. But, you know, uh, let me ask you if you remember this. A uh, guy named, you heard his name, T.W. Twait. I've heard of that, but I don't know. Seizes three rum cars, allegedly Canadian ale, fell prey to Prohibition agent Henry Twaits on the Crown Point Port Henry Road. <laughs> Listen to this one. Early Saturday morning, 1928, November. Vardo Falmer of Plattsburgh and Frank Manette of Champlain <laughs> and a man who gave his name as Roy Bumford and his address as Albany were apprehended by the officers and charged with Transporting Intoxication Prohibition Act. Arraigned before the guy in Keysville, each of the men were held in $2,000 bail. The cars, two Cadillac sedans and a Cadillac touring car were turned over to the authorities and the ale was destroyed. I had the fate. You mentioned that before. I forgot that you were the one involved in this. I just saw his name on the top. That's when I slept in jail overnight. That's when you slept in jail overnight. <laughs> that was 1928. So he made the North Countryman. Sure. Of course, Uncle Frank made the North Countryman a lot back in that time, but not always as a driver. Not as a driver Listen though. to this one now. November 9th, uh, June 1930. Oh, my, my. Eagles border hawks trim Willsboro playing a sparkling brand of baseball behind the bang-up pitching of rookie Frank Manette. 
<laughs> Phil Eagles' border hawks uh, hammered out a 10 to 1 victory. Manette held the Willsboro batters to three hits and was master of the situation at all times. The Champlain team is made up of all local home talent. Monkey, monkey. certainly made a monkey out of the Willsboro batters. <laughs> and the Champlain border hawks lineup was T. Hamline, second base. Hamlin. Hamlin. Hamlin yeah. McRae, first base. Remember which one he was? Randy McRae. Randy McRae. Coleman, left field. Coleman at the bigger in town, I guess. That okay. cold, I never e. Knew. Coulomb, third base. Ernest. Ernest, Ernest Coulomb. Trembley was shortstop. shortstop. Uh, P. Coulomb, that's P, P. was second. right field right and field. a heck of a hitter, I'll tell you. P. used to play second, too. Second, he was a heck of a hitter. Oh, yeah. Uh, another Hamelin, Hamelin? There's two Hamelin. It uh, was a catcher. Yeah. And he, H. Coonan, now there were several H. Howard. He was the center field, that's Howard. Howard, old Howard Coonan. And but that was the pitcher. And again, in the baseball game of June the 8th, 1930, Frankie Manette got four hits and six appearances at bat, but they lose to Lime Mountain by a score of 6-5 to five when pitcher McCray, uh wild pitch, they run home. So you didn't lose that game. You weren't pitching. But so you, there's two things here. One, he's, he's spent the night in jail, and this one here, they're praising him all over the community. <laughs> well, now, we didn't leave Orville out on here either. February 21st, 1948. Mrs. Laura Trumbly and her nephew, Arvo, both of Champlain, have opened the new Midway restaurant right. two miles south of the village on the champlain Plattsburgh Road and are specializing in Italian spaghetti dinners, quick lunches, and regular meals. The new eating house is completely equipped and presents a very exceptionally fine appearance. Uh, later, an addition for a dance hall will be built. It's on one of the main highways from the, the south to Montreal and should do a good business. And that was located right next to the Trombley. How long did you were you there? Or three years. Three years, huh? Uh, three years too long. Yeah. Three. Years. <laughs> All three right. Years too long, yeah. <coughs> I hated that business. You hated that business? I oh. thought you liked that. No, no, I thought I would, but then Fred the Trippy took it over. And the Trippy. Trippy ran it for a while. Yeah, ran it for a while. Then he rented it. Sonny Keith ran it. Sonny Keith. You know, the uh, customs duties nearly doubled in Rouse's Point, it says here, back in 1933. Uh, there was a thing here about, you mentioned Harry Goodrow. Who mentioned Goodrow? I did. He, right. was, he was a cousin of my mother's. He was cut the man. He was yeah. awarded $8,000 by a jury in Supreme Court uh, for libel action against the New York Times. Uh, they more or less said that he had let some... Uh, Rub go through. He was he a customs officer? I think he had one. He had one, and they they said they they they, they had an article about him that wasn't very uh, uh, complimentary. So he sued, and uh, he contended that a local U.S. customs officer, he had won two previous actions against the newspaper, had already collected damages. Uh, they said no matter what he was paid, it wasn't enough. He wasn't guilty. Uh, two Rogers Point witnesses subpoenaed by the defense were, were not sworn. Anyway, that's a... Where but, did you get all that stuff? Oh, out of the North Countryman. That's that. where I... That. Now, oh. one thing we didn't talk about, and we should because these two people know about it, we talked about it in passing. A picture of a, one of the most famous buildings in northern New York known throughout New England, just across the border. What do you think it was called? Meridian. The Meridian. There it is right here. That was known from Canyon oh. Board to California. Yep. Oh, yeah. All over. Very popular place. I wrote in the back of it during Prohibition, just north of Champlain. Uh, people from New York came to get their <laughs> share. Very well patronized from the 20s to the early 30s. Oh, yeah. It was located just across the border on, on the right. All right? Yeah, sure. Now, okay. you said that you would also go there to get loads? No, no. I've been there with a... The first time I, I don't mean you, but uh, did you ever pick up? Oh, my father did. Yeah. He picked up loads there. Oh, the totally. He gets well, both of his boots from there. Yeah. But the first time I went there, I was about 16 years old. That's the old Do You yeah. remember Bum, uh, Bunham La Fountain? Who? Bunham. Bunham, yeah. Well, we're down here one Saturday night. They were walking around. We had about a dollar between the two of us. Bunham says, Arvin, let's walk to the Meridian. So we're just kids, really. We walk over there and... That's where you saw all the fur neck pieces and the, the Cadillacs and the Lincolns, you know, all of them. <coughs> so the head waiter, which was Ferdinand St. Maxon. Up there? Yeah. Oh, he, he was? Oh, he was here. He was oh, I didn't know he worked oh, there. Sure oh, yes. Was. And yeah. uh, he met us at the door. 
brought us to the table. So we had, our, our point was to get a quart of beer for a dollar. That was a lot of money those days. So we had two dollars between the two of us. But there was a, a band that played there, a fellow by the name of Harold Hartley was the head band. I never met him before, but Bunham knew him because him and the band used to come down to the swimming hole and swim. So he brings us to the table and the uh, the band leader waves to, uh, to uh, Bunham. We always call him Bunham. And Bunham called him over. He come over and he says, hey, how about fix, fix us up a couple of girls to dance with? He said, I'll bring over two. He leaves, he brings two of the showgirls over because they had a 14-piece uh, band and a 22 chorus girls. I look at Bunham, he looks at me. We got two dollars between the four. <laughs> <laughs> so, See that boardwalk? I used to be all boardwalk going yeah. from the border to the yeah. port. You know. <clears throat> so, uh, well, you hear that board that went out here, right? The boardwalk. That was yep. all boards. All so boardwalk. anyway, the band started playing before we had the waiters even come over to get, get our order for drinks. Well, the girls started talking, and Bunham started talking about picking berries or something. These girls are 23, 24 years old. We are 17 year old kids, or 16. They, they had dances promised, so when the band started playing, and the two girls got up, and some other guys who were older fellas and danced. When they more than left, we were gone. <laughs> I was who paid for the drinks, but we were gone. <laughs> was this the new, the new Meridian or the older one? The new one. Okay. Meridian. Oh, there's only one. There's, there's only one, one right in. There was one, one that burned. Oh, that it burned. Well, that was after. Great. Oh, it burned after? After. No, 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 the no. The new was That was knocked down. Oh, okay. I, don't, I don't think it burned. It, uh, it was knocked down then. That doesn't make a <laughs> See, that was my experience at Meridian. <laughs> well, there's, I have a, a picture here. That I'm not ready for this. I may have to take a break to find it. Uh, he, here is, I'll take a short break and be right back. Now, the Meridian was not a small place. They're talking that you could have a thousand patrons in there and still have room to dance. And it was patronized. I, when I was traveling just out of college, I traveled down in the Albany and south of Albany, Schoharie County uh, area. And when they asked me where I was from when I'd make calls on these business places, and I mentioned Champlain, New York, more than a few I would say somewhere between six and ten people have told me that Champlain was famous for one thing. They said the Meridian. We used to go to the Meridian. These were older people than oh, me. Sure. They said, do you remember the Meridian? I said, I don't remember it. I know where it was. He said, they used to come up here. All the people from all New York City north came north, up here. Florida, Florida people used to came come up, up here to the Meridian. Like, Why? And we had people in relatives from uh, Springfield, Mass, who come down every weekend, these young fellows. Yeah. They were 19, 20 years old. We yep. had the best but, band from New York City. Yeah, they had big way band. down south to go through this border area. Yep. And now, then they stopped. They had to stop overnight. They'd come in the Meridian, then they play, they play just overnight till they got to Montreal. I'll go back to the mid Midway. Yes. Yeah. When we first opened that up, I told my wife one day, I said, you don't need to come in today. We had it rained a lot it was the spring of the year and it was no the parking lot was all mud so we put some planks so they could walk this great big limousine pulls up in front four people come out and i'm alone in there while i have breakfast so i said god that looks like somebody i know and i kept looking at her and looking at her it was very great is that right <laughs> i didn't dare speak to her about it but i wasn't sure I served their breakfast, ham, and they, they sat at the counter and they would enjoy their meal and all that. They thanked me, they tipped me, and they left. But it was in the paper the next day where they came through the border. They'd been on tour. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it, it had to be them. Yeah. yeah. So it wasn't your favorite place to be, the Midway? Oh, no, I didn't like you it. You didn't like it? No. I had a three year contract. If I'd had a six month contract, I'd have left in six months. <laughs> so I'm used to being outdoors, you know, right. working a, or grew up on a farm. And yeah. Uh, you get nice summer days in the summertime and stand everybody's out enjoying themselves you know, behind the bar and oh. well i remember the midway at least well i i wasn't i never drank much i didn't stop in for that but i can remember a great party we had there you remember your your parents 60th anniversary 50th or 60th no, it was, huh? it was at the midway no it was at the midway it was at the midway we got pictures and that had to be about 1960, uh, because my, my two girls were in it, and they were probably three or four years old. 
and I think they were their 60th, it could be their 50th, but I thought it was their 60th anniversary. Well, I wasn't there at that time. Account. You weren't there then, huh? was running that Okay. No. Uh, we remember that's where they had the nice fireplace, remember? Yeah. We, we were well, all up there that time, right yeah. There. I know it, but yep. I used to go there often, dancing. When so Sonny put the fireplace in. Well, to show you, not only did they pick up liquor, but they had to get rid of this stuff. Not that, but here, let me tell you. The custom sale at Rouse's Point, 1935. Rouse's Point serves and persons from the surrounding town will be given an opportunity to bid a variety of seized merchandise. Everything from a box of chocolates covered with uh, chocolate-covered cherries to automobiles. The terms are cash, uh, got Winchester cigarettes, uh, smoking, two pounds of chocolates, a, to a Ford touring car. And they used to sell these cars at, at auctions. Oh, yeah, right over here. There's some great pictures around that, that show the number of cars that they used to have. Here's a picture here. And if Calvin can freeze that one in, we will uh, explain what you're looking at. Okay. This picture, the building on the right is the, is the uh, Holland Hotel. That's and the right. Customs House is where Meyer's building is today, right the next one. to the uh, yeah. uh, Grand Union. And all those cars you see were cars that were for sale. They have them in Champlain. What year with that? Huh? You sell it over here. Right here, too. This auction was in 1921. 21. It was located in what was then the U.S. Customs House. The vehicles parked on the east side of the road in front of the, Ho the Holland Hotel were being auctioned after being seized by federal officers. The vehicles had been used in running bottles of whiskey across the border. Was it whiskey or was it Every alcohol? Whiskey, wine, wine. Both? Wine. This Look. photograph is from a Johnson collection is on a glass plate provided by Alec Gosley. And you can see the people just to the center of the picture to the left. There's a lot of people standing. That's the people who are bidding on the cars. You yeah, can well, see if, them. If my father got a, lost a moose car... He'd go back and bid on it? Yeah, he'd go back and bid his car back. <laughs> yes. And you know, uh, uh, talk about John, Charlie Caswell. My father was a man, if a guy was alone, he'd talk man to man to him. And if my father lost a fast car, he'd say, Leon, was that your car? He said, yeah, it was. And Charlie used to tell my father, he says, you're the most honest bootlegger there is. Who's Caswell? He was an officer? Yeah, the officer, oh, yeah. Well, no, yeah. Charlie Caswell. Yeah. It was Elm, a, he was with Hamilton McRae mostly all the time. Then yeah. too. Hamilton McRae was also a customs officer. Yeah. Of course, it was a game in a way, wasn't it? It's you a know, game. It's just like these court, the court things you see. The Gettys trial. That's a game, really. It's a, I, I hate to say that, but they don't allow you to say certain things even though they're facts. Right. Yeah, and, and here, well, they had already, it's too late, so they said that was your car. He said yes, but they don't arrest him. They know Hammer Clay oh, was no, a custom man. He, he never went to over the fourth year of schooling. Yeah. yeah. But he was a customs patrol, I think. When he came up and he was in customs patrol, Ham was, uh, when I was building my house here, he, I remember borrowing when you were up there building. I borrowed his uh, roller, remember? And he was well thought of in town. Yeah, he was uh, been many years here at... Uh, yeah. But right, they used to break all where, down where uh, Bill Earl was here. They had a, a bunch of, oh God, as big as all this here, broken bottles. Oh yes, they used to break bottles here. They used to break them right in front of the Catholic Church. Right. There's an article in here I wanted to, uh, I wanted to we read. two places one time, they've been. They done the River Street, they were done the last. The, on the first start... Hey, that's, what, that's where Johnny Craig come in. I was about uh, 15 years, 14 years old, maybe, and I take a wear bib overalls and loose one, and I tied it my pant leg with a binding string from the farm, you know. Yeah. Go down to Bill Earl's, and when they break the liquor, I try and steal the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I take them up like this. I take a bottle when they also want to look at it, slide down my pant leg, and they go into my into my pants and jump my bite. But there wasn't too much liquor in the start, so mostly all Then I take it over to uh, old Bert Jefferson, and he gave me five dollars for that bottle of liquor. <laughs> and one time, somebody squealed on me. I, I, one of the boys, it was actually a real nice looking bottle, but I got it. And I put it in my pant leg, and I'm just getting out of my pants. Some guy grabbed me by the collar and shook me. Who? Johnny Craig. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And he took the bottle away from me. And he booted me in the rear a couple of times. <laughs> that was it, huh? Yeah, was you know, there is a uh, there was a complaint in Rouse's Point. They kept breaking these bottles of liquor uh, right behind the next to Gaines is the marina, and uh, 
it got so that the that people smell. were complaining because of the odor, smell. the very strong smell, and they, they, they finally stopped uh, breaking them there, and they went further up uh, to, to get rid of them because there was such an odor coming uh, from stopped, the area. They stopped down River Street. Did the same thing here, you know? When I seen Charlie Cosgill do this, the boy used to watch him when he was he had a, Of course, he had a revolver. he take a, a bottle of liquor or beer, throw it up in the air, take a revolver out and shoot it. You remember that? I never seen him do it. <laughs> oh, I've seen it. I've well, seen that. <laughs> you, you, one more thing. You see that, uh, you know, we, we, because we mentioned uh, Uncle Frank there down around Port Henry, this is Uncle Frank right here. This is a 1942 picture of uh, Frank Manette right here. If you can free, freeze that in, I'll uh, get you a little idea what this was. This was from the North Countryman uh, in 19... Champlain soldiers with the 403rd Field well, Artillery. That's old Frank himself. That's old Frank right, himself yeah. right there. And, uh, he was 109 consecutive days of action. The 403rd Field Artillery was finally withdrawn. Remember that? They made the big push to roll. Oh, yeah. Yep. It amassed a total of 202 days on the line. Oh, yeah. The greatest number of combat days held by any 85th Division unit. Push, push, push all the time. You saw a lot of action. Old days, uh, old we, days. We used uh, 155. We used to go ahead of the mortars. <coughs> Don't talk about it. <laughs> now, <laughs> we talked about the Meridian, and there's other things we could talk about the Meridian. Let me just uh, get this picture up again here. I guess this picture for Calvin to put in. Because in addition to what we've heard, other things took place up there. There were boxing and wrestling oh, shows. Sure. Yeah. 1940, they had such a great space uh, coming to the rescue when it looked as though the boxing card here in Champlain couldn't continue. Amy Bassalo, the manager of the Meridian Club. Bidoño. What? Bidoño. Bidoño. Oh, gosh. Amy Bidoño. All right. They decided to have some wrestling uh, and boxing matches up oh, there. Yeah. Now, the people who were going to box in 1940. Bob Perry. Bob Perry, Moore's. And Soldier Logan, we know Bob Perry watches our program, and 160 pounds then, Bob. Uh, Soldier Logan, who tips the beam at the same weight, will be featured attraction, while Jojo Gomez of Shazy, K.O. Timms, Bill Timmons of Champlain, oh, remember Bill, them? Yes, yes. Will get together in the semifinals, and Russell Casava, Shazy, and oh. Morris Matat, Morris, Champlain. That was one of the best boxers that was around. Who's that, Morris oh, Matat? Oh, which Matat family was he? He fought 21 fights between Champlain and Rouse's Point. Is that right? And he, nobody ever finished the second round with him. <laughs> he knocked every man out in the first, first, first or second round. Clifford Pussa, Shazy, and Young Brunel of Rouse's Point. Yeah. K.O. Schaff of Rouse's Point and ba Joe Styles of Shazy. Young Olini. Oh, Dick Olini. Dick Olini from Champlain and Don uh, Donovan, Shazy. Yeah. And... Carl Parsons of Champlain and Gerard well, Carl, Gregware. Carl was a good man. Carl was a good oh, boxer, too. He Carl. used to box against Bob mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. The other one, before we take a break, is this. Lion Trudeau of Rouse's Point. All right? Uh, Ch uh, Lion, uh, Lionel. That's Young. Calvin's uncle and your brother-in-law. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, is going great guns in the heavyweight division, and Tiger Brown of Montreal is scheduled to meet in the main wrestling uh, match. Baby Trudeau, uh, Baby was the, was his brother. He's yeah. called, sometimes called Cub, right? No, that wasn't Cub. That was the well, one. That's a different one. Morris. Well, that's yeah. Morris. And Gus Larkins of Plasberg will grapple in the in the semifinals. They also took place just above the border. The uh, uh, third man in the ring, the referee, was a guy named Bert Snyder. Oh, Bert Snyder. Remember him? He was Olympic champion of the world. Yes, uh, uh, in, for Canada, and he was a customs officer yeah, or yeah. border patrol here. And he. Uh, he used to train the boys out of box. Yes, he did. Uh, the whole group here. We'll take another short break and come right back. Before we ought to mention that Lion was also famous for sleeping with uh, Ed Bevero. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Every he, yeah. he was telling oh, us yeah, that yeah, he yeah. jumped in and, and, and a bed with, uh, and it was hiding. That's right. Uh, <laughs> he had a lot of wrestling here in town. All right, because where I was, on oh, the sure. corner there, they yes. have a wrestling yes. here and everything. You know. Plutt always used to wrestle. Plutt was a yeah. lion on them. Yep. That yeah. was back in the 35, 36, 37 we, we, time. We had boxing there too. Oh, sure. Side wrestling. Yep. Now here's a, just for, while we're at it, here's a, uh, one of the <coughs> promotions in the North Country of 1940 oh, at the Meridian. See? July the 5th. 
I think it says. July 26, excuse me. Uh, Eddie Craig, that's John Craig, who did the shooting son, uh, now living down near uh, West Point, New York, married a P uh, Plattsburgh girl, versus Sammy Baker, Young Olini, and Morris Franks, Clifford Pusson, and Ray Brunel of Rouse's Point, Morris Matat, Champlain against Young Gagne of Chez Z, and Bob Perry, up yeah. to 165, eating well. Bob Perry's Bob starting Perry. to uh, yeah. to move up here against yeah. Bob Jones of Plattsburgh. And then Baby Trudeau against Roy Gibbs, referee Bert Schneider, and Mission 35 cents. Is that what it was? Well, yeah, and uh, you could have beer while they, were wrestling, while they were wrestling in boxing, do you know? No. Up in the Meridian, they didn't no, know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. While they were there, Man, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. My old man didn't miss one of those things. Did they get good crowds on the oh, break? to tell you they were. <laughs> Oh, well, all around, they get yeah. crowded up there like yeah. a yeah, sardine, people. like sardine. Yeah, they, well, of course you had people from the different communities, wow. you know. Well, they came from Plattsburgh all around. So what happened over here in Champlain? Oh, no. Hey, they never had a license to run. Uh, wow. Yes, that's what I heard. That's what closed it off. That's what I heard. We'll take a short break. Come right back. You're watching Hometown Cable. We kind of got away from prohibition a little bit here, but these guys are active in so many things. And we figured we'll just bring this up a little bit, and then we'll be right back. Thanks much for watching our program every Sunday and the program's every uh, day of the week all seven days Calvin and Sam getting out there and getting a lot of uh, last night uh, this is the 21st I believe today last night Calvin was in was in Plattsburgh and had two games in one I guess it was Saranac right Calvin uh, Saranac playing NCCS and they went to triple overtime the ladies before they uh, uh, finally beat Saranac that was my third game of the night. That was your third game of the night, and it was a double header that one game, and we want to congratulate the NCCS girls, and also, of course, the boys of both JVs and varsity who won last Saturday against Flatsburg High School, each by one point. Showed a lot of determination and a lot of spirit. All right, Jeff, my father had more guys drive. I mean, of course, this is this off the record? No, you're on. You're on. I bet you said at least 15 different men drove Different people that drove for him, huh? During the crazy time. Yeah. They would just do it at certain times. No, and no, it, someone quit, go to another yeah. bootlegger. Yeah. They all paid the same, though, just about? 25 and 25 was pretty... But my father said when he was paying $30 a night, I'd drive a trip. Someone would drive to make three trips in one night, and he'd give him a $10 tip. Give him a Is that dollars. right? <laughs> God, that's a lot of driving. I drove for the old man, no trip here. Yeah, two times, mean, not too much, but I got in with the biggest stuff like uh, Eddie Green yeah, and yeah, all they, that. They were the big boys. But where were they from? <laughs> Plattsburgh? Oh, yeah, Eddie Green, Plattsburgh. Plattsburgh. Oh, Dewey Sifford, he came from Watertown. He married Margaret Sifford and all that. I mean, Margaret, uh, and my wife. The Fountain. Yeah, she yeah. was married to uh, Dewey Sifford. Uh, in, in March. 8, 1928, North Countryman. I did this very quickly last night, just grabbed some of this. 1928? 1928. Customs officers and Border Patrol from the Rogers Point Customs House seized 210 bottles of Canadian ale while it was being transferred between the D&H trains in Plattsburgh uh, yesterday afternoon. The contraband had been shipped in five barrels from Peru, New York to an address in Terrytown and was billed and labeled as potatoes. Right. The express messengers in making the transfer at the Plattsburgh station accidentally dropped one of the barrels, allowing some of the amber contents to run out of the ground. The deputy collector, uh, uh, Roy Delano of Rouse's Point, was notified, and Inspector Robert Halstead and Border Patrolman Cash Cashwell and Dubbins Casual. went to Plattsburgh and confiscated the smuggled ale. Incidentally, Deputy Collector Halstead bought a new Pontiac Coupe while he was in Plattsburgh and drove it home last night. You were the customer. Well, yes. Now, and again, this is a real. This is not an old paper, but it's, it's 25 years old. It talks about 1930. In addition to the customs officers at the ports of entry, there were customs patrol officers in cars and U.S. Border Patrol officers in cars. Right. The last were administered and directed by the U.S. Immigration Service. All were on the alert to apprehend smugglers, whether or not they were bringing in booze or illegal aliens. They also brought in illegal aliens uh, in the cars. One of the Eddie took one out. Oh yeah. Three of it to Canada. One of the members of the U.S. Border Patrol was Bert Schneider, the first man to win an Olympic gold medal for Canada. One warm 
sunshiny morning, the D&H train number 34, the day train, was standing at the D&H station in Rouse's Point. As on every other day, the train blocked Pratt Street uh, from Overton's Corners to uh, Rouse's Point. One of the cars standing on Pratt Street was a large open touring car with several well-dressed gentlemen. Behind this expensive touring car was a border patrol car. In the patrol car was Bert Snyder. The men ahead of him decided that they might as well have a little liquor, a little liquid refreshment, and brought a bottle of, uh, out from in the car and passed it around. Bert left the patrol car, approached the car ahead, and informed the passengers that it was against the law to have or import alcoholic beverages. The word was passed that there is no doubt that the men gave him some smart replies. About that time, the train pulled out, and Bert told the driver of the car to turn left across the track and park in the area near the D&H station. They parked as instructed, and Bert left his car. The discussion was far from quiet. Somewhere along the way, Bert took exception to something that was said. The man who roused Bert uh, was Gene Tunney. Yeah. Bert told him to get out of the car and he, Bert, would knock his head off. Tunney asked Bert if you know who I am. I'm Gene Tunney, he says. I know who you are. And do you know who I am? He said, I'm the Canadian gold medal Olympic boxer. You get out of that car and I'll knock your head off. <laughs> and this is Gene Tunney, the world champion heavyweight boxer of the United States who had beaten uh, Jack Dempsey. Now that they were properly introduced... Things quieted down a little bit. Gene and his companions said they would return to Canada with their liquor. They drove back up Pratt Street, turned north on Church Street. A customs officer who had observed all this followed the Tunney car. Instead of going back to Canada, the car stopped across the road from Roy Delano's house. A man got out of the car and went behind a large tree. The car then turned around and drove to the customs house. The officer from the yard looked behind the tree and found several broken bottles. The bottom of one held some spirits. The necks of the bottles were taken to the customs office, and Tunney and his friends were about to be released when the evidence that they had imported contrary to the law. The penalty for undeclared liquor at the time was $5 a bottle and the signature of a consent to forfeiture signed by the importer. Tunney feared the front page stories in the newspaper about his being fined at the border, and one of his companions agreed to sign and pay the penalty. There were no blows struck by Bert Snyder or Gene Tunney. The customs and immigration officers at Rouse's Point considered it a one-round match, and there was no doubt that Bert Snyder won by a TKO. Both champions are now dead. Each was a gentleman and a scholar. May they meet again in a happy land where they can recall their now, this is Gene Tunney. A lot of famous people came through this border in this area. Uh, what year was that? Death, well, this is 19, early 1930s. Oh, for God. See? Who wrote it? Uh, uh, I, there isn't a name on this one. It's probably Jack. Sidelight on history. I'm not sure if that was Jack or not on that one. I really don't know on that one. But I, I enjoy reading these old things. And you mentioned Betty Grable going through here. Many of the big bands used to, as you say, get Lombard here too early. Band and all them big bands. Yeah, they would go to the Saxony too. Well, they don't know. Oh, that's the Saxony, but the old Windsor. The old Windsor, but well, see, uh, like one time we had this couple stop in, a man and his wife and his son. You never knew. Stop and the son it. told us who he was. It was James Nevels. He played Junior at Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yeah. yeah they, they came from. They came from. Uh, into Canada somewhere to the way of uh, yeah. Michigan. Yeah. And he bought his father a brand new Cadillac and his mother a brand new car. Yeah, we, uh, some of the customs officers used to keep uh, autographs of people that came through and you know, Lowell Thomas, the old thing. And so I, go ahead. I called up uh, the fountain and used to have the, the cabins there. Was it Joe LaFountain? Joe. Oh, gosh. Joe, Joe Lucien. Lucien. Lucien, yeah. yeah. And uh, I set him up for a motel. And they said, if you're open early enough, we'll either eat down there or leave it, or eat over here place. But they, they blew the horn when they went by. They did. Yeah. Yeah. And then there was another time we had a five-piece band come in, four fellas and a girl. And of course, we had, on a, we had a dance hall at that time. And we had a 
microphone standing up on a stage and all that. And they got talking with me. They want, they want some supper, so we, I fed them. And they asked me, if we, we, do you mind if we come here, say, bring in our instruments and we'll play and all that stuff? We had the drums there. But they came in. And they were there about two hours. <laughs> and boy, they were out in New York City and they were going to be down at the Bellevue Casino in Montreal. And the guys that used to stop in at that time from work, they come in and have a quick beer and were gone. The bar filled up, the stage. <laughs> Word got around, huh? Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. They come in there, yeah. that band was playing. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you met a lot of women. A lot of, a lot of yeah. prominent people who invited both yeah. of them. Oh, of people yes, people. lots of people. Yeah, a lot of people I never knew. I never yeah. knew. Yeah. That was the only town there was on the old, the old border. Right. Then I met these people from Montreal who were in the textile business. And they used to buy a whole season tickets of uh, the baseball down there. That's before they had to. The new ones. The new one. Yeah. Oh, and uh, Jerry Park. They, they buy season tickets <laughs> right on a, on a line, a whole box. And he said, anytime you want to come to the ball game, bring some friends of yours. And we'd love you to use them anyway. They call up, they'll be in the mail, or they come back to here, we, oh, we'll drop them off to you. I took down Jimmy Glowd, uh, myself, and the Lion Tudor. Oh, we went out a bunch of different times. You know, I. We appreciate both of you fellows coming in and talking with us, and we'll do this again when you've got an idea of what we're talking about. You can think of some stories and different things, and it's, it's very hard to, uh, uh, I'm trying to moderate here, but things are, uh, you know, it, you know we're, we're going all over the place, but still, it's what, it's what it is. It, it's wow. got, we've, heard some, we've heard some expressions you may not have heard on TV for a while. <laughs> we hope we haven't offended anybody. And certainly, uh, when they were very excited, and uh, uh, <laughs> Ed said, I didn't forget I was on TV, he said, but we hope that we didn't offend anybody, and uh, we, we, we well, tried not to mention too many names that would get anybody too upset. Uh, but we really appreciate these well, people coming in and talking with you. Guys, we mentioned them. They're dead anyway. They're dead, but their family's are. Uh, <laughs> but I guess if you could talk dead. about your father. All and, dead. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> if you like this type of thing, I wish you'd let Calvin or I know about it. And if you've got any stories you'd like to add to this, and you're welcome to come, and we'll talk with you. And if you are too bashful to get on TV for there's something like that, or if you'd get the story to us, we'll see that uh, it gets on TV. And uh, we want to thank all the people that have contacted me and mentioned how much they enjoyed seeing Jimmy B. Sec, uh and his uh, sawmill and, and also his son Marvin oh, I saw that. on TV. They, well, we've heard some great things about that, and it's one thing I want you to know out there. I've been told more than once that one of the smartest persons in the North Country could do anything was Jimmy B. Sec, and probably still can. And uh, we thank you very much, Jim, for uh, taking the time to be with us. This will be a classic. One person told me it should be on national TV. <laughs> <laughs> you mean I miss it? Yes, he was great. Yeah, he was uh, a great show. Uh, one of a kind and uh, so sincere. And, and uh, I, I really enjoyed that uh, doing that with you, Jim. And we appreciate your comments like that because it, that's all the pay we get, right, Calvin? That's what we get for pay. Calvin works very, very hard. I work occasionally like this. It's not work, ever work. Uh, I've talked with Orville about this before, Uncle Frank. We've never got into bootlegging too much, have we, Uncle Frank? We talked about other things. Oh, I've often wondered why they never made a movie out of this. It's a good question. It, it certainly would be uh, a great place here, you know. Oh, yeah, with town and stuff. Oh, there. yes, sir. Yep. Okay, well, we're going to call it a day here. Thank you very much for watching Hometown Thank Cable. Thank alive. So and remember, <laughs> 1 o'clock, 4.30, 8 p.m., midnight, like 8 the following it. morning. We're all done. You got to change it? Yeah. We're changing it. Forget 12, those times. 12.30, 4.15. 12.30, 4.15, 8 p.m., and 8 the following morning. At 12.30 now, so you're going to miss us if you don't get in there at 12.30. More and more. Calvin's bringing you more. More hours of hometown cable, which means if you want to send more money to help to pay for this extra time,